and this will be given by Dr. Von Nordegraff, <laughs> Anton, who uh, is professor and chair of the Division of Pulmonary Sciences at Amsterdam University Medical Center. It is a tertiary referral center for pulmonary hypertension in the Netherlands. And Anton's work is focused on mechanisms and treatment of pulmonary arterial hypertension, right ventricular failure, pulmonary hemodynamics, and clinical studies in the field of pulmonary hypertension. I think today, as we've kind of already heard, an important challenge in pulmonary vascular disease in general is how do we improve the monitoring of treatment outcomes in clinical practice and clinical trials? And I think we have been taught over and over again that prognosis in PAH and pulmonary hypertension in general is determined by RV function. So there is really a need for simple and reproducible measures of RV function that reflect both RV, RV deterioration and improvement. And I think of Anton as one of the best physiologists I've had the privilege of knowing and even working with. And so I've asked him to tie it all together. So Anton's going to present us the talk on assessing right ventricular function using exercise, imaging, and hemodynamics. Anton, welcome to Boston. Yes, yeah, thank you, Aaron, and thank you for inviting me for, the, for this uh, keynote lecture. Um, of course, it's a bit tough for you after having a nice uh, lunch to sit down and listen to a guy who doesn't speak so fluently uh, English uh, with a low tone, Dutch guy. <laughs> so um, therefore, I just, especially for the fellows, I have a test at the end, because then we are going to look whether my presentation makes some sense. And I loved the presentation this morning. I really loved it. And I do think I will, um, I agree on, on almost everything. So some of the things will come again and be covered in this presentation. A conflict of interest. First of all, I want to cover the pathophysiology of the right ventricular failure because if you don't understand it, then uh, it's a problem. And then afterwards, we're going to assess the right ventricular function by exercise and imaging. This is the previous uh, figure from the guidelines, and Francois showed the next one. And actually, it's very important if you're talking about the right ventricle. The right ventricle is not working in isolation. And we are recognizing it more and more, and I will bring some work on that as well. So the right atrium, it's not a passive bystander. Venous congestion, systemic venous congestion, it is very important. It's killing the kidneys. It's killing the, the, the liver. And for pH, the lungs are the most important part because it's always the load which kills the right ventricle in that case. Then we have the left atrium and the left ventricle, and we already heard about how this impacts in a lung transplantation, after lung transplantation, because the left ventricle is an atrophic state. And the systemic organs, they really matter in this case, and especially the kidney function. Then this is another important figure made by Francois Dat, and which is in that European guideline. And I want to go into that, because there is a lot of confusion how to assess the right ventricle, what is really a right ventricle parameter, and what is a, a parameter which reflects the interaction between the lungs and the right ventricle? So heart rate is something really coming from the heart. Contractility, elect, uh, 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 elastance, systolic elastance, or diastolic elastance, is coming from the right ventricle. It, it's completely load independent. Pulmonary vascular resistance, on the other side, it's completely dependent on the pulmonary vasculature changes. And already it is mentioned this morning how important this is, this parameter, and I will go into that. The same applies for arterial compliance and arterial elastance. And then we have the components we look mostly in the clinic. Right ventricle pressure, it's not a right ventricle parameter. It is a parameter which is produced by the right ventricle in relation to its load. Uh, the pulmonary artery pressure, the wedge pressure, the right ventricular volumes, they are in relation to the load, stroke volume, and so on. Ejection fraction, TAPSI. So TAPSI is not, it's like uh, ejection fraction, it's not a parameter of the right ventricle, it is a, a reflection of the right ventricle to its load. So I've been sitting in a plane for six hours, I get some massive clots in my lungs, 
my tepsy will go down, my contractility will go up twice. And at the end, also the coupling is a systemic parameter. So it's all about the load. And to understand the load of the right ventricle, I want to go into that. Because the pulmonary circulation is unique in comparison to the, right, to the systemic circulation. Or probably the systemic circulation is unique to the pulmonary circulation because systemic circulation, you have the aortic arch. This really determines the compliance. Pulmonary circulation, we don't have an arch. So we have only two components which are the major components. Then we have a third component, which is less important. The first one is the pulmonary vascular resistance. That's a really a pulmonary vascular component. The other one is the compliance, that's the stiffness. And they, of course, are linked to each other in one way or the other. And how do we measure pulmonary vascular resistance? Mean pulmonary artery pressure divided by cardiac output. Compliance is measured by stroke volume divided by the pulse pressure. What makes it unique? Well, that in the systemic circulation, the pressures are proportional. So if you have the systolic pressure, you can calculate the mean of pulmonary pressure as well as the diastolic pressure, whereas in the systemic circulation, this is not the case. And that, again, think about the aorta, has to do with the aorta, who is a really, um, it really depends where is the resistance and where is the stiffness and the atherosclerosis. So this is very helpful because that makes the, and that, that is proportional because that makes, for instance, the systolic pressure reliable also to estimate the mean and the diastolic pressure. And where did, does this come from? Why did, where, where is this proportionality come from? So here you can see the curves of the, 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 the pulmonary pressure when we go up. The, this comes from an inverse relationship between the resistance and the compliance. So the more, the higher the resistance, the more stiff the system comes, the lower the compliance, which makes a lot of sense. If you have at one point resistance, you can calculate the compliance. You also can see different things from this figure. For instance, that if you have the early diseases, then compliance changed a lot. In many papers, you can read that compliance is a more sensitive marker. And this is the case, especially in the early disease. So measuring compliance in early disease is very sensitive, probably more than changes in pulmonary vascular resistance. But in the end disease, pulmonary vascular resistance is more important. And from that on, and this makes it more, a little bit more complex after dinner, is that we can calculate also the power of the right ventricle. So the right ventricle has to overcome two load parts. One is the pulmonary vascular resistance, that's called the mean power, and the other one is the oscillatory power, that's overcome the stiffness. You can calculate, if you have the pressure curves, the amount of energy it takes for the right ventricle to overcome these different components. And actually, it was Nabil Zauti in the Blue Journal who did that work, and he found out, and it's also medically, you can calculate that, that always 27% of the energy of the right ventricle is devoted to the, overcome the stiffness of the system, and the other, um, 80, uh, uh, 73% is to overcome the resistance. So 27% for the stiffness, the other one for the pulmonary vascular resistance. What does this mean? The pulmonary vascular resistance in itself is a perfect measure of load. You had just to, well, to multiply it with 1.3, and then you have the total amount of power. And that also was mentioned by Brad. It is important to measure the pulmonary vascular resistance. And then you have already the load, and that helps you, and you can calculate the energy. So, in summary, first summary, many will follow. Pulmonary vascular resistance is a perfect surrogate measure for the right ventricular load. And the compliance, yes, it is sensitive in early disease than resistance, but you should not say, well, the compliance is always more sensitive than resistance. It really depends in what part of the disease you are. Actually, the right ventricle doesn't see the load. It sees the pressure. And then we say, well, the pressure is determined by the right ventricle itself. That's correct. But the right ventricle, when it produces the pressure, it also gets its reflection on the myocardium. And that causes myocardial stretch. And we do know from very, very well from physiology that it's the wall tension which determines the stretch on the myocyte. So hypertrophy in itself is not bad because it improves the wall thickness and by that reduces the wall tension. Enlargement of the right ventricle is bad because it increases the radius and by means of that formula, it is bad. 
And uh, so um, you, and, and the, the pressure, of course, is also proportional to the wall tension. So wall tension is really what the myocyte faces from everything. So if you see the, the two examples, the, both had the same pressure, but you can um, agree with me that the upper person uh, who's here have a low, much lower wall tension or even a normal wall tension because he has a hypertrophied right ventricle, not enlarged, even although the pressure is high. In this case, it's bad news because the right ventricle is hugely dilated. And then you get a myocyte stretch, which is four times increased. And that, of course, has an impact on the right ventricle and the myocyte itself. And it causes all types of things. And I will come into that. Then we discussed this morning the coronary flow, and it is important. We do know that it is uh, an, uh, that that in case of pulmonary hypertension, the right ventricle only gets blood flow during its diastolic phase. So you need more, you get less. That is not very helpful, especially in ec poor economical circumstances. Um, so this is not helping because the right ventricle needs a lot of oxygen. We discussed this this morning, the contractility also the increased heart rate. And we get only uh, perfusion during the diastolic phase. Again, it was mentioned this morning, the importance of keeping the systemic pressures high. And I agree very much with that. So when we were discussing the inotropes, then um, there is always a plea to increase a bit the systolic pressure by re increasing the systolic vascular resistance, also because you improve coronary perfusion either by using depressors or norepinephrine. And then the consequences of the wall tension, another one, is the left ventricle wards failure, uh, uh, septal movements. So we see the septal movements very early in the disease already. And it's not because the, the systolic pressure in the right ventricle is higher than in the left ventricle. It, the consequences is, is because the contraction of the right ventricle is much longer than the contraction time of the left ventricle. The left ventricle is already in its diastolic phase, whereas the right ventricle is still contracting. And that moves the septum to the left. So you can see it here. It leads, and this is the figure, it leads, this is the right ventricle pressure tracing, this is the left ventricle pressure tracing. It leads to the circumstance that at a certain moment of time, the pulmonary valve closed, but the right ventricle still continues to contract which is called a post-systolic isovolumetric contraction time. Not very energetic, uh, efficient, but uh, this is what happens. And this also points out why I agree with Monica that this level is very interesting to look for by echo, because you can see all these phenomena, also in very early diseases, to monitor it, the sex view on a uh, mid-ventricle. So in summary two, hypertrophy reduces wall tension, catecholamines it means increases induced contractility and progressive dilatation of the right ventricle to maintain stroke volume at the cost of an increased wall tension. I will come to that. Because what's about the contractility then of the right ventricle? The contractility is already at a maximum. The right ventricle failure is very different from the left <laughs> ventricle failure. The right ventricle failure is the failing of a top athlete. Contractility is improved and increased to its max but it can't increase further. So if you are exercising, your contractility will not increase. And it's very doubtful whether dobutamine or milrinone ever will also increase contractility in those patients. And that was also the debate of this morning. Do we increase contractility? The right ventricle is just working at its max and it increases, like it was said, oxygen consumption if you try to do more. So this was the work done by uh, Ono Spruit. He performed it in, uh, um, in controls. And the only thing you had to look at is the systolic elastance. This is the control situation, a resting condition, exercise. This is what is our, in the case in our patients. It's fivefold increased uh, uh, contractility, but it doesn't increase during exercise. Now, this is, again, important to keep in mind because now we go a little bit to exercise further. Because if you look to the echo and you do the exercise testing and you look to the change in pulmonary artery pressure, then you know that a patient who can increase its pulmonary artery pressure is, um, is doing much better than a patient who can't increase its pulmonary artery pressure. This is data from Eckhart Kruning in circulation, and he showed that very nicely. Now, you might ask yourself, well, why is this? Is this because those patients who are doing fine, nice have a contractility reserve, or is this because these patients can increase uh, cardiac, uh, heart rate. 
because heart rate can improve much more um, uh, the, the cardiac output as well. So is it chronotropic reserve or contractile reserve? And I showed you already, even in the earlier stages of diseases, the patients are working at its max at rest and conditions. Indeed, heart rate is important, and we probably sometimes forget about it. We have discussed all fancy parameters this morning, but if our patient is in the clinic and enters our room, and he has a heart rate of 60, you can be sure that the right ventricle is nice, unless there is some uh, um, uh, delay on the EKG or something like that, or there's a block. So it, the heart rate is very important, and this was found out already in the 2009 B for Hankins, just look into EKGs, and to the EKG you find out that it is a low heart rate really is predicting a good prognosis, and if your heart rate is not is changing at, uh, at uh, during time and um, uh, get lower during treatment, it's also very predictive of a good prognosis. So it is important. Stroke volume, contractility, they are max already at, ex at baseline. Heart rate can change. And this is, of course, coming from the Sun paper, and many of you are familiar. And, uh, everything is in that paper, which is, was based on the cardi cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Heart rate in severe pH is high at baseline and can't change a lot during exercise. So that's the upper part of this graph. In normal situation, you have a low heart rate at baseline and you have a huge chronotropic reserve. In moderate pH, also, your chronotropic reserve is limited. So that is why the change in heart rate at exercise, as well as the baseline heart rate, is important. So everybody, even without an echo, have a very good circuit measure of the right ventricle. We normally forget about it, but uh, we should uh, think about that. Stroke volume, we do know that stroke volume really doesn't change a lot, or um, uh, in the case of pH, this was done on a study basis, uh, uh, Sebastian Verhoeven, uh, and then it was repeated many times by other people that stroke volume, especially in spine position, doesn't change, whereas it does in healthy persons. And this, the other study was from Guido Claesen from Leuven, and he showed the same thing in controls as CTEF. So, do, and that's why is that? Because the contractility is already at its max. So, that is why stroke volume is so predictive at baseline, because it predicts already the state as well as exercise. Again, the right ventricle is working at its max. Again, stroke volume is very clinically important parameter, and I'm also happy that to know that we can measure and estimate it accurately by means of the echo. Uh, this is the work from uh, Jason Wedderwald, and he did it by means of the right heart cat. And he looked at the baseline characteristics, and you can see that the first is the cardiac index, then you have incorporated the heart rate, the second one is the stroke volume index, and it's even more sensitive, makes a lot of sense, and that is why it is the case. Now we come to the point Aaron made this morning. Aaron said to me, as I said uh, during this audience, well, I just make the six minute walking distance. Well, it makes sense because it incorporates the stroke volume as well as the chronotropic response. So this was a work from the French group, um, uh, from Provencher, and what he showed is that if you look at the baseline, the distance, and, you, and um, uh, the stroke volume and the chronotropic response predict the six-minute walking distance, which is also the same as the maximum oxygen consumption. So again, a plea for those critical uh, valuable parameters. So what are the symptoms of a patient? Of course, it's oxygen delivery to the muscles. And that's why the patient had the problems with climbing the stairs because they used the muscle which uh, used the most oxygen and that caused the problem. We are all familiar with the FIC principle that it's the frequency and the stroke volume which is important to deliver the oxygen consumption. And now we understand why the patient is into trouble. So, in summary three, the contractility of the right ventricle is at its max during resting conditions, meaning also the stroke volume is at its max at resting conditions. That really tells us that stroke volume at rest is a very strong prognostic parameter. It doesn't change during exercise, but pulmonary pressure can change during exercise, and this is dependent on the change, mainly on the heart rate changes. That also explains the eckhart Krunik paper that the patients who had more increase in pulmonary artery pressure are the patients who are doing better because they have more chronotopic reserve.
But of course, if we really wanted to understand the right ventricle, we, we needed to, uh, to, need, uh, to know uh, some elements more. And that is, of course, the volume of the right ventricle. Um, and we do know that the failing right ventricle is uh, going to the right. We do know that we needed the end systolic and the end diastolic volume, and Francois already alluded to that, how important the end systolic volume is. The more it shifted to the left, the right, the poorer the function. The difference between the end systolic and the end diastolic volume line is the stroke volume, and we also have another component, and that is the diastolic pressure. So this is a patient who is failing, and the elastance, which is the conductility, is going down. This is a patient who is more or less adapted, and this is the normal situation. I hope you are all in. If you incorporate parameters of stroke volume, and in this case, end diastolic volume, and probably end systolic volume is better, then you arrive at a very good predictive score, and probably you should also include, in that case, the heart rate. So it helps you to discriminate the patient at baseline who are doing poorly or who are doing uh, okay. And also it helps you to monitor the patients during the treatment. And I will come to that later on, when to monitor the patients. Should it only be at baseline or uh, what's the most valuable? Or should it be up, for instance, after three or four months after therapy? So we have another component, the right atrial pressure, which is important, and the right atrium. And I believe for a long period of time that it was just a bystander, the right atrial pressure. So there was hypertrophy of the right ventricle. As a consequence of that, the right ventricle pressure increases and, and the diastolic pressure, and that was it. Actually, it's not the case. First of all, it is prognostic. It's an independent prognostic parameter. So it's independent to the systolic function. Again, this is data from Jason Weatherwald from a lot of right heart cats he performed when he was in France. Uh, and I do know that from the early data, the Lonto data, right atrial pressure already was found as an independent predictor. So it is, I can show you many, many studies who show that. It is also in the risk score, again, from, from France. It is an important parameter, six minute walking distance, right atrial pressure, cardiac index, and the near class, and or anti pro BNP. If you have those parameters, you can predict very nicely the parameters, and it is reflected in many risk scores. What is going on in this right atrial pressure? Something is going on because the right ventricle becomes more stiff, and that's beyond its only hypertrophying. You can not only measure the systolic elastance, but you can also measure the diastolic elastance, and that is the curvature of this uh, increase in pressure during the filling phase of the right ventricle. And by that, we showed in our study that it is prognostic valuable, and the stiffer the right ventricle, the poorer the prognosis. And especially in patients with scleroderma, this might be something important because it is so important to the prognosis. And then it is, of course, a little bit due to the hypertrophy, but it's also a bit to the fibrosis. And also uh, on the myofibril uh, uh, um, uh, mediated thing, and I will come to that. So we did isolated preparations of the muscles. We put them in between, and we could, by using that technique of the right ventricle, by using that technique, discriminate what is the contribution of those. And actually, what it was shown is that the fibrosis contributed a part, but the most of it was the, uh, the myofibril stiffening. Why is the myofibril stiffening? That is due to the deforcephalation of the titan molecule, which is a stretch molecule, which binds it to its uh, elements, and this becomes more stiff, probably under the influence of the catecholamines. So the higher the catecholamines, the more stiffer the right ventricle seems to, to, to be, and that causes this increase in right atrial pressure. And that it is not an, uh, and a bystander was also shown by Jeroen Wessels. And you had to, if you want to see this paper, you had to search under his name and not under mine because they misspelled my name, uh, <laughs> which is frequently the case. Uh, but uh, what it showed is indeed that, that what happens in the right ventricle, and we can see that the normal adapted and the non adapted right ventricle, you can see based on the colors that there is a lot of difference. The things he did is also he looked for um, uh, the, the passive and the active part. The more um, failing, the more active con the, con the, con the contraction co contributes to the emptying, and which of course makes sense. And that's also why we want to avoid atrial fibrillation. But he also he showed that there is a lot of fibrosis in the right atrium, and that is uh, and also that the, the myocytes increases in size. So there is a lot of stiffening of the right atrium. And the right atrium stiffening, together with the right ventricle stiffening, 
are the, 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 the main contributors to the venous backflow. So when the right atrium is contracting to, into the stiff ventricle, it's not only pushing the blood forwards, but also backwards in the system. It's not a tricuspid regurgitation. I haven't forgot about it to show that on the slide, but it's mainly the stiffening. So the systemic contribution of PH is mainly due to the stiffening of the right ventricle. Now, of course, we discussed this topic tomorrow, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this morning, reverse remodeling. Um, and of course, we wanted to have a reverse remodeling. Uh, we made a slide, uh, we made a criteria for that. How could that be? And of course, we wanted to have all our patients into the, cranes, the, to the green zone. So with a normal stroke volume index, with a normal TAPSI, with a normal right to the fraction and so on, and a normal volume. This data was also shown this morning, and this is from coming from the uh, 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 pulmonary transplant. So we performed an MRI before and then afterwards, and then you can see indeed that the right ventricle has an unique ability to recover. So that is the real purpose of it. And I agree very much with Marius that we should worry about the left ventricle after lung transplantation and that in all patients with PH, uh, single lung, uh, lung transplantation uh, fulfills. Um, but manage the left ventricle in an appropriate way. Is it possible to, to, uh, to, to recover the right ventricle? Yes, we can recover the right ventricle if we reduce the right ventricle, uh, uh, if we reduce pulmonary vascular resistance by more than 45%. So unloading the right ventricle by just giving the good the treatment to the, to the right ventricle is very helpful. And especially you can see this also in calcium responders. Those patients respond actually extremely well. The right ventricle decreases to the normal size within a couple of weeks. Um, and this is another data from the ECHO data supporting this day as well. If you just give a reduction of more than 45% uh, in triple agent treated patients, then the right ventricle fractional area changes recovers to its normal shape. This is data from SANS, more modeling based again, 45%. So uh, unloading the right ventricle is the best way to help the right ventricle. And if you are able to do that, then you are fine. But of course, it's difficult. We do know that it makes sense how to treat the right ventricle. So being aggressive in the, in the initial approach seems to be beneficial. This is all data comparing monotherapy from dual therapy. What you can see from this in the gray bars are the dual therapy. That there's much more recovery in the patients who had a dual therapy than the monotherapy. And similar things happen if you add triple to aging treatment. We are looking forward to what is coming next. So unloading the right ventricle by at least 45% helps you to guarantee the right ventricle to recover. And even then, this is also the date from Mariella van der Veerdonk, the pressure volume loops changes more or less to its normal place when you do so. So this is what we wanted to achieve in our patients. Of course, we have similar data from the ECHO, and this is coming from a recent paper looking to the, uh, a couple of data sets uh, where we agreed on are important to get uh, monitored when we see this uh, reverse remodeling in the right ventricle. Then the question is, does the diastolic properties of the right ventricle also improve? And the answer is yes, it re improves as well. And this was also shown by Jeroen Vessels. So we can get reverse remodeling of the stiffening of the right ventricle by phosphorylating the titan. Now, we have, now it's time to wake up again, everybody. And let's do the test. So I have two questions to you because I have gone through all these parameters. And we have the data published on the Sotata set. So, um, the first question is, does Sotatacept, and I will show you in the next slide, the date, does Sotatacept improve right ventricular function? And I want some reflection from a brave person in this room. And the second one is, does Sotatacept impact right ventricular contractility? Of course, it's a little bit tricky to do that, but let's try it. So this is the data. It's published recently by uh, Rogerio Sousa in uh, the European Respiratory Journal. And what he showed is that indeed, in pulmonary pressure drops down in sotatacept compliance goes up, right ventricle work. Um, bit strange to calculate, but it goes down. I mean, right atrial pressure goes down, antiprobe and P goes down. And here you can see all different the parameters as well from the echo. It's, and then we have the TAPSI divided by the SPAP, which goes up. So the first question, does the right ventricle function improves? 
I do think everybody expects something. It, it improves, right? Yeah, it certainly it improves. Yeah, we can't disagree on that. Um, because every, every parameter we measure on, on the improvement is there. Huh? So, so it is, it was this, 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 I saw the signal. Then the second question, is the contractility of the right ventricle remaining the same? Because improvement can be unloading, but it doesn't mean that the contractility of the right ventricle is not impacted by the drug, either beneficial or not. So somebody who wants to give an argument that it is the same or deteriorated or improved? You think it's down? Yeah, can you go to the microphone and explain? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, it's difficult, right? And uh, because this data doesn't tell you, actually. So it are all parameters we measure now are, page, uh, are parameters of the systemic of of, of the uh, of uh, 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 all parameters are parameters which are due to the fact of the interaction with the right ventricle to its load, but not intrinsic parameters. So systemic parameters. So based on the on the on the, the first slide, so we can't say yet, but of course we have some data. So you can try to to find out whether that works. So and we have some data on the right ventricle, which was in the study and supplementary data. So this is the baseline, this is the treatment response. This is not zero. This is 15. Of course you can think about when I draw a systolic line to it, systolic elastance. Does it make a bit of sense where it arrives? It should not be uh, well. You can of course plot it a little bit down. It should at least here around five or ten, and not come to zero. But that makes a lot of sense. Of course, first of all, it is not its area; it's not volume. But volume should not be zero if the pressure is zero. Look to the autopsy room. Your right ventricle always has a volume, so that makes sense. So, in my opinion, at least the data suggests that contractility is not harmed. But it's not the strong evidence. We had to prove it further to do that. So. What I want to say is we had to play with the data in order to get the data. And you, the, the, the answer to provide is a drug impacting directly on the right ventricle is difficult to answer unless you have the data. So I don't know the answer yet. I do think it's OK. When should we assess the right ventricle? That's another question. Of course, at baseline. And many of the data are on baseline, but I do think the most important time point to measure the right ventricle is at follow-up. And there's many data for that. First of all, let's look to the weather world data. Um, it is uh, uh, the baseline, not so very much predictive. Look what happens with the hemodynamic data at follow-up. And fortunately enough, it is follow-up. I mean, that, that means that our treatment matters. If the, our treatment would not matter, then baseline would be OK. But our treatment matters. When the patient responds, it's OK. The same applies for uh, MRI data. It's much more sensitive after one year follow-up as that baseline. This is from Lucas Land in uh, published recently in CHEST. And I can show you many other papers who show the same figure. So and why is that? Because if the, the right ventricle is really adapting, then it is the volume is not increasing, and then the function remains the same. If it is maladaptive, then the right ventricle volume increases, as is shown in this slide, and then the patient is going to die. And the red ones are the patients who are going to die. So that makes a long uh, a plea to at least to use the follow-up data for, um, in the long-term prognosis. So I would argue that the initial risk assessment is very important, and it really makes decide what treatment you want to give to get a really reduction in pulmonary vascular resistance. But if you want to really know where your patient is, at least do the follow-up at three or six months. And this is very critical, at least, to know what is the long-term prognosis. Now, our approach, as I showed, and, uh, and, and, uh, is in a lump sum. So we measure stroke volume, we measure pulmonary heart pressure, we measure tapsy, and so on. But we a little bit neglect the heterogeneity of the right ventricle. And this is, again, and I'm almost finished, so don't worry. This is, again, the data from uh, Monica. She showed this morning in scleroderma page. It's a nice picture. What does it show? The changes, the strain in the different compartments. And what does it show, additionally? When you exercise 
or stresses, then the apex contribute most to the, uh, to the changes in stroke volume or changes in, in uh, the, the exercise condition, and the mid secretor level doesn't change a lot. If you look to the four dimensional flow measurements, you can see probably the same thing. So this is the normal heart, because it's my heart, so it works. Everything contributes to it. And here it is in PEH, and you see that there is directly a movement from the flow from this part to the other one, probably because this part is mostly contributing and this part is not doing a lot. So we get the heterogeneity in the heart, and this is nicely pointed out by Monica. And it is not, as she already pointed out, it's about structure, it's about <laughs> function, the, the relation between structure and function. I would say add another one, it's flow. And we have every component into it to measure it now and to understand it better and also to understand why is this part, for instance, less contributing and why is this important plane so important to monitoring. Another point which was uh, mentioned by, uh, I believe, Nick, was uh, uh, also uh, the, 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 the wall stress. We have excellent parameters to measure wall stress in the aorta to understand the creation of aortas, uh, aneurysms, but we can also use it for the pulmonary artery. So we have this strain analysis as well for the pulmonary vasculature. So again, we have novel instruments to understand much better what is going on. In this case, this was a patient with a BMPO2 a mutation together with a pulmonary artery, uh, abnormal pulmonary artery venous connection. So it was a volume and pressure overloaded system, and then you get this huge um, dilatation of the pulmonary artery, and in Stanford they would operate on it. Um, so the take home messages. The right ventricle does not act alone. The right atrium is important. Systemic venous congestion and the interaction with the kidney is important, but also there's the interaction with the left atrium, especially if you unload the right ventricle and at lung transplant you will face the right left ventricle. Most of the variables we measure in the clinic are systemic parameters and not intrinsic parameters. This is okay because it is all about how does the right ventricle act with the load. So it is okay to measure systemic parameters, but it doesn't help you to know exactly whether or not a drug impacts the right ventricle. So sometimes for scientific purposes, you also needed to know the intrinsic parameters. Perfect pulmonary vascular resistance is a perfect measure of right ventricle load. And if pulmonary vascular resistance is reduced by at least 45%, the right ventricle will recover. That's good. So let's do that in our patients. But if you fail, you have to follow up. Stroke volume is good, and it can be measured at baseline. Heart rate as well is essential. But then, of course, you had to add the volumes. I, it, I changed my mind in the last years, and systolic volume is a little bit more predictive than in diastolic volume, which is more uh, uh, under the influence of the volume state of the patients. So if you have this two, all three together, it helps you. And I'm sure that the novel techniques will help to shed new lights on the heterogeneity we detect in the right ventricle from disease to disease to understand it better and, uh, and to understand the relationship with the structure, the function, and the flow in the future. And by that, I want to thank you. Great, great talk. I do want to follow up on Sotatacep question. I can't get my head around the fact that it reduced PVR but doesn't change cardiac output. I know Paul has a theory that it, because it increases hemoglobin, then you know, the cardiac output is not uh, calculated accurately, but what's your take on that? Okay. Um, uh, the, 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 this question has intrigued many, and, uh, and, and because we do know from all these other trials that cardiac output goes up, and in this case it doesn't go up. In my opinion, physiological thinking, uh, uh, two things are important in, uh, in your body. First of all is the pressure in your brain, and the other one is the oxygen delivery, and that's why we have baroreceptors and GMO receptors. Mm -hmm. So if those receptors are satisfied, you don't change this cardiac output. In case of the most of the, of the, let's say, the prostacyclines, and that was already, the, the paradox was already found out in the 90s, you also reduce the systemic vascular resistance, and by that you had to increase your cardiac output at rest. 
That is important part one. And it is very interesting to see that in the low cardiac output index patients, and you can see this from the supplementary data from the SUSE paper, stroke volume goes up. But in the high cardiac output or the normal cardiac output, let's say cardiac index of 2.5 or something like that, it doesn't go up. It, and it just means the right ventricle serves the body. That's the one thing. The other thing is the oxygen delivery. The oxygen delivery is probably Im improved by other mechanisms, like an increase in hemoglobin. Uh, and it is important in that fact, and also probably even myoglobin level, we don't know. So if the chemoreceptor and baroreceptor is satisfied, there is no need to increase cardiac output. But in case the cardiac index is too low, then also in the SOTATEP study, look to the supplementary data and have the, 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 it goes up. So I, I, I'm not, I'm, uh, and that's why I, I took a little bit this provocative uh, data. Um, uh, I'm not at all convinced that it impacts in a negative way the right ventricle. I'm quite convinced it doesn't. It improves it. Good, thanks. But I like this agreement on this topic. Mark. In that study from the subtenders of the previous question you're asking, but do we have enough data to really go ahead with sick people with subtenders? Because it's looked to me like a significant portion of the people in that study had pretty good cardiac output. Yeah. And yeah. yet we're inclined to throw the new drug at the worst patients, those with yeah. uplane and is there enough data in that paper to... No. No, that's the, 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 the real answer is no. That's probably also that the Senate study is currently performed, so that is in more end-stage diseases. And we really should recognize it, that it really determines in what phase are we providing the drug to a patient. And probably sometimes it's, it's something good in a certain phase and bad in an end-stage phase. Um, so, um, certainly we don't have enough data for the end-stage right ventricular failure patients, um, but at l the good news is that data is coming, and uh, we are looking forward to that, and I hope that also this allows to perform some physiological meaningful assessments uh, to, uh, to, to get this information. Sorry? Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, it's really a pleasure to uh, introduce uh, the art of hemodynamics. What does the right heart condition uh, really tell us? And it's my pleasure to do this uh, session together to share it together with. Uh, Bradley, who had already this nice talk tomorrow, uh, this, uh, this, this morning, and Jane. Um, and first of all, Paul, and I paved, the, I guess, a bit away on the pressure volume loop, but I'm sure you will tell more about that. So Paul, I heard he is uh, from jail, prof assistant professor and the director of the Pulmonary Vesca program. Ple pleasure to have you here, oh, Professor. Actually, you are an anesthesiologist, right? Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm Paul Hurt. We're going to uh, talk a little bit about pressure volume relationships. Uh, I rearranged the title a little bit because I'm going to start with PV loops and move on into coupling and afterload. With respect, a few uh, disclosures that really don't matter much here. There's nothing directly relevant. More importantly, is I'm not an engineer. So for those of you that are, uh, please don't embarrass me in front of the room. Come up and do it later on. <clears throat> Secondarily, uh, as mentioned, my clinical training is as a cardiac anesthesiologist. I also did ICU work. Um, so over the last 30 years, I spent a lot of time looking at waveforms, scrolling across the screen, either in the OR, the ICU, or in the lab. Uh, and that's kind of the background here. Just as a little bit of note, I probably spend way too much time on that, and having a digital data acquisition system allows me to replay all this stuff in front of me. I've spent far too many Sunday afternoons sitting in a chair looking at my laptop. Um, when our daughter was in kindergarten, she came up one time and looked over my shoulder and said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm doing some work for work. 
She said, it looked like squiggles to me. And I said, yeah, that's about, there are squiggles. A few days later, somebody at school asked her what her mom and dad did for work. She said, my mom is a surgeon and my dad looks at squiggles. So, <laughs> but I'm, I'm actually in pretty good company. If you go back to the late 1890s, Otto Frank, this is a wonderful that re review, was published in, in 18, talking about his work using isolated frog hearts where he created initially, initially he created pressure uh, volume pressure loops that were subsequently changed, but importantly, it also created isometric or isovolumic curves. And we're going to touch back on some of this work, but this happened again in the 1890s, so these concepts are not entirely new. I want to then discuss a little bit of the concepts, talk about the theory and practice of using pressure volume relationships in clinical practice, and again, we're going to emphasize on using information in your diagnostic right heart cath, and also some alternatives to this. Now, I would like to start with the idea of using source data, which I regard as being direct or synchronized, using a surrogate for volume or imaging, which is unsynchronized. And let me show you some examples of that. So if I take, this is the green is the RV volume, blue is the RV pressure. These are measured with a conductance catheter, which has both the capacity to measure volume and high fidelity pressure simultaneously. We're able to generate these nice loops. Secondarily, though, is this idea of using surrogates. And some of you may have come across this. this. The black represents the pulmonary arterial flow. And if you think about it, the RV volume is going down in green as the flow in milliliters per second is going up in the proximal pulmonary artery. So if I integrate the area under the, volume, the flow curve, that tells me the total volume change that occurs during ejection. And if I flip it over, it actually superimposes directly on the ejection portion of the volume. And people have actually used this as a surrogate for creating the systolic portion of the pressure volume curve in some methodology uh, uh, validation studies. Now, more commonly now we're looking at imaging and there are reports in the literature of doing pressure volume relationships using ventriculography, MRI, or more recently 3D echo. The difficulty is how to do this simultaneously and if the data are not sampled at the same rate, how you actually synchronize them. This is an example of a study that we actually have going, a clinical study using conductance catheters in humans. The green is volume again. And this is the simultaneous 3D echo volume. And you can say there's some similarities between them, but if we actually create a pressure volume load here, they give a little bit of different interpretation. For example, I'm not sure what this late drop in volume is that we see in the conductance and also, secondarily, if we look at here, it looks like we're having an early loss or rejection of volume as the heart uh, contracts, as if potentially we have tricuspid regurgitation, a finding that isn't apparent on the conductance volume. Every textbook that you read in there, cardiovascular textbook, talks about pressure volume relationships being sort of the reference standard for systolic and diastolic function. And this is an example. So the classic way of doing this is we take a PV loop, we then reduce the preload somehow with cable occlusion or a valve salve or something. We regress the upper left-hand corner of that. It gives us the end systolic pressure volume relationship. There we go. And it gives us the V0, or the volume that theoretically would be left when the ventricular pressure goes to zero. The slope of this relationship, as we've heard before, is regarded as end systolic elastance or a load-independent metric of contractility. All right? We can then also then get some idea of a lumped or a summary metric of afterload. And this has been presented before with the idea from this first loop here that as the stroke volume goes off into the circulation, the forces that are opposing that ejection, let's say they're resistive, elastic, and reflective, they ultimately determine what the pressure of the ventricle is at end systole. So the idea is the slope of this relationship calculated as the end systolic pressure, which would be here, divided by the stroke volume, gives you the summary metric of afterload. So we can then take this from our pressure volume relationship. If we regress the diastolic portion of it, we're able to derive the nonlinear end diastolic pressure volume relationship, which has a, an equation. It can also be used to calculate elastance at end diastole. And I've highlighted the, the B here, which is a stiffness constant, which you'll commonly see in the literature from this analysis. Now, I have a hard time understanding what a stiffness, a nonlinear stiffness constant is. Other people have then said, well, why don't we solve that end diastolic pressure volume relationship and predict, for example, what the pressure, uh, what the volume would be 
at a pressure of, let's say, an end diastolic pressure of 30 millimeters of mercury, or 15 millimeters of mercury, or 20. You'll find them all in the literature. And this gives you an idea of stiffness based on capacitance, which is a number in milliliters. It's the number of milliliters that would be present at an end diastolic volume of 30, which makes it clinically a little bit more useful in something that we can understand. So here's what we have, and you'll see this again in the textbooks, is what we can do with this wonderful pressure volume relationship. Well, we, we know contractility. We can actually tell you the end diastolic volume as an indicator of preload. We have arterial elastance as total afterload. We have the slope of the end diastolic pressure volume relationship to give us some idea of diastology. We can look at the ratio of end systolic elastance to afterload as a coupling metric. We can take the area of this loop to define stroke work. We can then take the area of here defined by the end systolic and end diastolic and the lower portion of the loop to define what's known as the potential energy stored in the walls of the ventricle. If I add the stroke work and the potential energy together, we derive what's known as the pressure volume area, which is a pretty close correlate of oxygen consumption. And if we look at the work that is done as a function of PVA or oxygen consumption, it gives us some idea of efficiency. Now, there's a few little warts in this that we're going to spend some time on. First is the idea that, well, maybe we should actually consider the pulmonary arterial wedge pressure when we define the slope of arterial elastance. And there's been some things going back and forth in literature, and I don't know what your thought on this. I'll be interested to hear what you think about this. Another one of the warts is, what do we do about V0? Now, V0 is a, is a kind of a wild card, uh, and there are interpreting that is a little beyond the context or the scope of that we'll be able to talk today. But there's actually things in the literature suggesting that the shift of V0 along this axis is a more sensitive indicator of contractility than the actual slope of the end systolic pressure volume relationship. What I want to focus even more on, though, today is this idea of end systolic pressure, which in nice idealized area is in the upper left-hand corner of the loop. And I think it would have been in the examples that you showed, Anton. Well, there's a few little problems with that. This, this is the classic LV pressure volume relationship in which we assume that end systolic pressure occurs at end ejection and is followed by an isovolumic relaxation period. Problem is that the normal RV loop doesn't look like that. The normal RV loop is not rectangular. It's more triangular. Again, this is normal in a low pressure setting. So if we begin to think about this, well, where am I going to find? I don't see that end systole and end ejection are going to come out to be the same thing. In fact, it almost looks like ejection occurs for an extended period of time. And this concept isn't new. In fact, in the early 90s, this paper suggested that for the normal right ventricle, there's actually little to no isovolumic relaxation. That if you look carefully, you can have flow going out the pulmonic valve at the same time you have flow coming in through the tricuspid. So how I define end ejection and end systole becomes complicated. And Francois showed earlier today the classic D'Italia figure where he talks about hangout interval, which is the difference between what we would say end systole is and when ejection occurs. And for the right ventricle, they're often not in the same place. So if we're looking at our idealized nice rectangular loops and I'm trying to do a cable occlusion on my RV, it gets a little bit more complicated because the shape doesn't necessarily fit. And it actually gets a little more complicated than that even more. Because when we look, the shape of the RV pressure waveform is not constant. In fact, the relationship between the peak pressure and what I would call in systole is dynamic and shifts depending on the conditions of the pulmonary circulation. This, for example, are our animal data at baseline and showing two levels of pulmonary vasoconstriction. And you can see how what's described as an early load where the highest pressure occurs early in systole to a shift where the highest pressure is now occurring late in systole or a late load. And here's what it does to the shape of the pressure volume relationships. We have a triangular one at baseline, but with some vasoconstriction, it begins to look like an LV rectangular loop. And this becomes even more pronounced as I produce a higher pulmonary arterial pressure. This, for example, then shows not only that these static loops change, but what happens when I do a cable occlusion or a preload shift as my standard reference for defining systolic and diastolic function. And with the triangular, you get a nice consistent shape but what you see is under certain circumstances of pulmonary vasoconstriction, the shape of the loop changes from my first portion to my last portion of the occlusion. So any methodology I derive for defining end systole with one shape of the loop may be different as I change the loading conditions and the, loop, and the shape changes. 
So it's a nice idea, but there are some works in how we're going to interpret this. And again, these are an idealized, well-controlled experimental studies. This is from clinical data, um, which is a really intriguing paper that was published a few years ago, showing that using conductance in humans, you get these nice, almost characteristic differences in shape, where they call it triangular, quadratic, trapezoid, or notched. But this underscores some of the limitations that you get from the clinical use of conductance as a pressure volume analysis. For example, if we look here, we find that their volume actually goes into a negative range. This underscores the ability or the difficulties, the complexity of actually calibrating the system to give you actual perfect volumes. Secondarily, if we look at this one, it almost appears that during what should be the filling phase in diastole, the pressure is going down which may well be true, but it also makes you wonder about fidelity of signals and, and control. So this comes up to be underscore one of the interesting things that I have been dealing with. I like loops a lot, and I'm not so sure that the loops like me. So <laughs> for example, continuous simultaneous measure and pressure and volume is rare in the clinical environment. And in fact, we really need to do a preload variation to interpret this, and that's even rarer than doing the actual pressure volume loop acquisition. The truth is, in the real world, the PV loops seldom look like those shown in the books. And this is something we have to deal with in terms of interpreting morphology. And the other thing that comes out is methods developed for the LV are not necessarily directly applicable to the right. The right is a dynamic scenario where the shape of the pressure volume relationship changes depending on the conditions of the pulmonary circulation. So let's think about then what you can do with your standard diagnostic right heart cath. Is there a way that we can take some of these PV loop concepts, derive them in a different way that may be applicable to a patient in the cath lab or at the bedside? And many of you probably come across the concept of the PMAX model for single beat estimation of, of right ventricular pulmonary arterial coupling. And if you haven't, again, conceptually, what we talk about defining this slope of the end systolic relationship is a preload reduction to create this slope. Well, theoretically, if I was able to keep the preload the same and progressively constrict, let's say, the pulmonary artery with the same preload, eventually we're going to get to the point where I completely clamp the pulmonary artery and the contraction is isovolumic. So the idea would be here, well, geez, if I can figure out or estimate what this, I, this maximum pressure would have been, I might be able to derive the slope going up. And this is described a long time ago initially as the, the idea of a hydromotive source pressure where you take the rise of the pressure, match it to the decline of the pressure, and fit it to an algorithm that picks out what this peak pressure would have been if the ventricle never ejected. Basically the same thing that Otto Frank measured in the 1890s in the isolated isovolumic frog heart. Now, there's, there are some things that are associated with it. The ability to do this is dependent on the shape of the waveform, the quality of the waveform, so those are some characteristics. But this methodology is pretty well established in the literature. And what it describes then is if I know this Pmax, and off of my pressure uh, relationship, I can define the right ventricular end systolic pressure, I can measure stroke volume at the time of the cath, and I can then calculate this slope going up as the Pmax minus the end systolic pressure divided by the stroke volume. We can then also apply the same methodology of calculating arterial elastance as an indicator of afterload by taking the end systolic pressure and dividing it by the stroke volume. So this is a single beat approach using this Pmax methodology, the pressure waveform and stroke volume to derive some of the metrics that we traditionally pull out from a classic pressure volume analysis. But how are we defining end systolic pressure? It's a key variable in all of these things. And if my method of end systolic pressure derivation is faulty, or if you do it in a different way than I do it, the result can be completely different. So in the, in the classic pressure volume world, if I take my RV pressure volume, my RV pressure waveform, or my RV volume waveform, uh, I'm sorry, my RV pressure waveform, I divide it by the RV volume waveform, I get what's essentially an elastance waveform. It's the pressure divided by the volume. And the common way in the, in the PV loop world is to take the peak of this, or the point of maximal elastance, and define it as end systole. Now, we had a discussion earlier about, and I, it was brought up, of end systolic elastance versus maximal elastance. And this is assuming that they're both occurring at the same time. But if you look in the literature, here's what people tend to use, the three most commonly used 
ways to estimate end systolic pressure used in single beat methodologies. It's either the mean PA pressure, mean PA pressure adjusted to a regression equation that's been defined, or RV systolic pressure. So in a project that we have going with one of the fellows recently where we're doing conductance and 3D echo and we got PA, here's an example. So we got a mean PA 5236, I mean the mean PA is 41. If we apply the, uh, the adjustment model that was described by Tello and colleagues in Germany, it actually gives us an end systolic pressure of 60, which is interesting because it's a little bit higher than the actual RV systolic pressure. But the RV systolic pressure is 52, and if I apply this methodology, it comes out that the pressure at the peak pressure volume level is 51. So under these settings, RV systolic pressure actually very closely approximated, and I don't know which what you usually use, you guys usually use for defining end systole, but. The mean. Huh? The mean, but the mean, I, mean the, PA? Yeah, but I agree very much with this. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so, but the interesting thing is if I look in the literature, if I then take these data and I calculate my EESEA as a coupling metric, the difference between using adjusted mean PA and PA pressure is two and a half fold difference. And interestingly enough, the RESP and the, the peak are, are quite similar, which is fine. If I'm doing a study and I'm applying the same methodology among all the patients across, I think it makes good sense. The difficulty I have is interpreting the number between study A and study B. One used mean PA pressure and the other one used RV systolic pressure to come up with completely different metrics for coupling. And that's where I have a difficulty in interpreting the number. Not that any of them are invalid, it's just translating one to another. This gets even more interesting than when we're using PA pressure. This is a, some study that, that Aaron was actually involved in years ago, which looks at the gradient between RV systolic pressure and PA systolic pressure. And what they find is there's a little bit of a gradient during rest, supine, cath. But when you go upright, often the PA systolic underestimates or undermeasures what the actual RV systolic pressure is. And if you exercise them, you find that this gradient can become huge. This was shown visually here in this study that was published in 2019, where at rest they had about a four millimeter mercury gradient between the PA shown in red and the RV systolic pressure shown in blue. But when they get out here to moderate exercise, there's a 20 millimeter mercury gradient between them. So it underscores that if I'm using PA pressure as a metric to define characteristics of RV function, I may be losing some of that fidelity in the setting where I end up with a large gradient between my RV systolic and my PA systolic. So <clears throat> this is something that's haunted me actually, I, embarrassingly for a long time. Now we and, we and many other people have used second order and higher derivatives of the RV pressure to define timing markers for the cardiac cycle. Um, Embarrassingly, this is actually something that I started doing in the mid-90s and never thought anybody would be particularly interested. But at the same time, I'm really not, so this one shows the second derivative of RV pressure, and I'm not really clever or smart enough to be able to interpretate, interpret the positive and negative deflections. They confuse me. So what we did a long time ago is simply square the value. And when you square it, everything becomes positive. The zero stays zero, but the other peaks get amplified. And over the years, we did some interesting things. So we compared this, this second derivative squared to RV volume, to PA flow, and what we found is it actually lines up quite well to predict specific events in the ejection or the systolic portion of the cardiac cycle. But the more meaningful thing we began to find was, if I take the same thing of this elastin, so RV pressure divided by volume, with the peak regarded as end systole, we found that the third peak in the second derivative squared lines up actually quite closely with the point of end systole. So now what we say is, can we use this as a more specifically defined, rigorous way of defining end systole? And we've moved on to that in, in our group. So this is actually something, a, a comparison that was done a few years ago that compares the second derivative method for end systolic pressure to RV systolic pressure, to mean PA, and to the PA adjusted using the regression equation. And what it finds is that the RVSP is actually quite good at high pressure, but it breaks down at low pressure. Alternatively, mean PA pressure is pretty good when the pressure's low, but it begins to break down as the pressure gets higher. The most precise methodology of all of these was the second derivative method, but when we do a Bland-Altman analysis, it consistently underestimates by about two and a half millimeters of mercury. Not a huge amount, and it's a consistent offset that can be adjusted for. 
The most accurate in terms of defining a bias or the average difference between them was the mean PA pressure adjusted. The problem is it has a very wide uh, limits of agreement to show that it's relatively imprecise, which is consistent with the data showing uh, you the one example where this method actually derived a pressure that was higher than the actual RV systolic pressure. So moving on to other things that we can do as we begin to talk about integrating data is that um, what if I actually have some idea of what the maximum and minimum RV volumes are? Can I integrate this information with the cath data that I would get from, from a right heart cath? This is a study that was uh, published a few years ago using conductance catheters in, in patients. And what they showed here is the change in the pressure volume relationship between the transcatheter repair of the aortic valve, the mitral valve, or the tricuspid valve. Now, when this was in preparation, it really caught my eye. Mickey Brenner published this because I'm looking at this and I'm saying, well, wait a minute. He's derived these end systolic and these end diastolic pressure volume relationships, but he didn't do any cable occlusion. He didn't do any preload variation. How did he actually derive these things without doing a cable occlusion? And what he said was, well, actually, we use single beat models that were derived from the left ventricle that incorporate maximum and minimum volumes along with metrics derived from the pressure waveform. And not only are they able to come up with an estimate of the end systolic pressure volume relationship or contractility, but this one actually is a way of, of estimating the end diastolic pressure volume relationship. Which to me is interesting because now do we have the capacity to begin to generate more of these classic metrics based on pressure volume analysis that we might be able to apply at the bedside if we take our standard right heart cath and we take, for example, simultaneous echo that could be done. So that's why I say other stuff. Well, that's caught my eye too because we had actually done a very similar thing in patients having a, a mitral clip. This, for example, the idea, could we take the classic analysis of pressure volume analysis uh, and derive metrics using a combination of 3D echo and, and uh, actual pressures? For example, this is where the left atrial pressure, as the clip goes on, you can see the left atrial pressure normalizes. And we were able to actually create these pressure volume relationship characteristics off of a single beat using 3D echo and the, and the data that were acquired uh, during the catheterization. So a couple years ago, we started on this project saying, well, OK, do these methods developed for the LV actually work for the RV? Can we take this further? And uh, we did a pull up, a, a compile a pretty large uh, data set from archived animal data. We applied the single beat methods for looking at end systolic pressure volume relationships and also the ability to define this V0 value. We used the single beat method for coming up for end diastolic pressure volume relationships. And here we looked at V15 or the end diastolic pressure, um, uh, the volume that would be present at an end diastolic pressure of 15. And we compared these to classic multi-beat cable occlusion data, for example, shown here. Once we did this validated in an animal model, then we applied it to a clinical data set. And it, interestingly enough, this is the example of, from the animal data that showed a situation where it worked perfectly. These, the two, the single bead and the multi bead reference standard are exactly, almost exactly run on each other. And this is the worst example. This is one where it didn't work particularly well. I'm not going <coughs> to pretend to you these things always work perfectly. But when we put them all together and we created this as a master data set, we found that the end systolic elastance contractile indicator and the V15 for diastology showed a very high correlation with what we would get from our multi bead standard reference of true pressure volume relationships with cable occlusion. We ran Bland-Altman on us, uh, which was pretty good. It was not terrible. They had minimal bias. Um, and what we decided that, OK, we have a methodology where we need RV volume, but we don't need the whole loop. We just need the maximum and the minimum and characteristics of the pressure. We, uh, we don't need to do the Pmax estimation or the model of the waveform, which is sensitive to, character, to uh, fidelity of the waveform. And we also are able to actually calculate a real value for this V0. We decided that it really had kind of acceptable bias, but all relatively wide limits of agreement that were not directly interchangeable with the multi beat reference. But when we consider the simplicity and the ability and the cost relative to doing something like a conductance catheter with cable occlusion, it actually may have some be robust enough for clinical application. An interesting thing came out, and this is why I mentioned why I think contractility may go down. This is when we applied it to a clinical data set of patients having a diagnostic right heart cath at baseline and during inhaled nitric oxide. 
So our standard vasodilator challenge. And I've circled just a few things here, hopefully you can see this, that the, in, this, in this group, and I think we had 22 patients in here, the, the RV systolic pressure went down. Okay, they're responding a bit to the inhaled NO. We found that DPDT also went down, and by 3D echo there was no change in the ejection fraction. Hmm. And when we took the DPDT, which is a preload sensitive indicator of contractility, and we normalized it to end diastolic volume, it suggested that the contractility went down. But the interesting thing is what happened when we applied the single beat methodology to derive some of the characteristics of pressure volume relationships. And we found that end systolic elastins as an indicator of contractility actually went down during the NO. And it was paralleled by a reduction in arterial elastins or a reduction in afterload. So then when we looked at coupling as contractility afterload, there was actually no change despite a reduction in RV systolic pressure. And when we looked at the diastolic characteristic, it actually didn't change. So the interesting thing about this is, does it add another component you can do during a diagnostic right heart cath that provides you information that you otherwise wouldn't have had in terms of determining the response to a nitric oxide challenge or a fluid challenge or something else. And so we've actually now been trying to, to implement this uh, during these. We've been able to do 3D echo simultaneously. This is an example of some work we've done. This is a baseline enduring nitric oxide with right heart pressures and a respiratory marker which is interesting because when you start the nitric oxide, the patients have a completely different respiratory pattern than they had before. This is a methodology that we previously published, the ability to detect RV ejection fraction just based on the pressure waveform, uh, which we find consistent with the other study. In this patient, the nitric oxide actually reduced ejection fraction. And now what we're working for towards is an integrated matrix where we can put a variety of data into the matrix. We can put volume and other data derived from 3D echo in, and we can calculate a whole series of metrics, including the classic pressure volume analysis relationship of work and systolic elastins and diastolic elastins uh, and efficiency. And we can then also drive characteristics of afterload, be it resistance or elastic or reflective characteristics, and integrate these then specifically with the, with the echo. So this is the direction we're going on trying to optimize using single beat type methodologies that could be applied during a diagnostic right heart cath. So in summary, the multi-beat pressure volume relationships are great. I like them very much. It's wonderful. And I'm kind of disappointed that they actually don't work so well in a clinical environment. You need a continuous volume measurement. You've got to properly synchronize the pressure and volume signal. And ideally, optimal interpretation requires a preload variation, which is not a simple thing to do. So into this void, we have single beat metrics of, of RBPA coupling based on some of the pressure volume concepts. Uh, a key element of this, though, is how you define end systolic pressure and the consistency. As I mentioned, several methods for defining end systolic pressure have been defined, but they yield different values for the coupling metric, so it complicates some of the conclusion. And what we're finding now is that increasing access to measurements of maximum and, volume and, and minimal RV volume coincident with the RV pressure actually raised the prospect of adding a new, more advanced single beat methodologies that allow us to provide a more comprehensive assessment, either diagnostically, prognostically, or the response to an intervention. So that's mine. I will send the last one showing here that uh, this is where the world has gone. Now we're working on ways of taking actual streaming data, using it to populate computational simulation models. This is actually showing the response to MitraClip, what happens in the left ventricle. And as I said, this is what my sons refer to as dad's video game. So with that, thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. This was really, really a very beautiful talk, and I loved it very much. Um, sit down. Come join us. <clears throat> so now it is my pleasure to introduce my good friend, Franz Richard, who is a professor of medicine at the University of Arizona. He is director of the pulmonary hypertension program at the U of A in uh, Tucson, and he's a member of the Arizona Saver Art. Uh, center. He's also an internationally recognized expert in precision uh, approaches to RV function, and he's a member of our PVDomics study group. So with that, he's going to talk to us today. Um, Got to find your talk title. Uh, pulmonary RV hemodynamics. 
maximal vasculature. Well, Doctor, here I'm, I'm glad to say that I, I'm, I feel some empathy because uh, now I, I realize I'm not the only one that sits around looking at waveforms all the time on the weekends. But uh, at this also, uh, Dr. Waxman, this feels a bit like a setup because I know Dr. Singh is after me talking about the distal vasculature. So I think um, maybe perhaps what I'll do is look at this from a different perspective and that uh, most of our attention is directed to the distal vasculature. I, I'm going to, I think, bring your attention back to the proximal vasculature in, in terms of especially drug mechanisms and, and how that might be uh, explaining some un unanswered questions. Uh, here are my disclosures, which I believe are not directly relevant. So, so we lay a foundation for what is the proximal vasculature. I'm going to define it in terms of the, the physiology of the disease in question. So as you know, the disease affects the distal vessels, which are pre, pre arterioles are defined primarily by their size uh, uh, at, at 500 microns or, or half a millimeter. So I'm going to define the proximal vessels as the, essentially all the circulation proximal to that. Now, depending upon the, the methods that you look at in terms of both uh, diseased and normal vessels, there is a slight difference in terms of the distribution of compliance um, and therefore contribution to pulsatile load and the resistance in the pulmonary circulation. Um, again, there are various methods of, of determining this, and they're quite complex, which I won't get into, but there appears to be about a 10% difference, and that, that difference, I believe, is important. Now, what happens in the disease itself, of course, as you can see uh, by the uh, figure on the right-hand side, is that there is stiffening of the vessels. Now, this may be an initial event, as there is some at least experimental evidence to indicate that or it may be a, a subsequent event later on down the line. It does tend to, the experimental evidence, however, does tend to indicate it is early in the stage of the disease. There's extracellular matrix uh, uh, differences relative to normal, which occur in the prox proximal arteries and lead to stiffening as well as tapering of the vessels. And as you can see there, there is eddy formation, as uh, others have eloquently shown today, in the distal vessels as well. The stiffening of the vessels also leads to um, reflectance waves into the right ventricle as it ejects. And the earlier an ejection, of course, as this occurs, the more uh, uncoupling there is between the, the relationship of the ventricle to its load. Now, I'm going to look at two main components here today with, with emphasis on the one on the left as to how this affects the right ventricle. But there is some uh, experimental evidence, particularly from the group in, in Colorado, uh, which has looked at the effects of stiffening on the distal circulation and the perhaps worsening of the, the distal disease model. So such that uh, norm, in normal circ circulation, there is a, a decrease in the uh, pulse wave velocity, the flow velocity profile such that the uh, flow is typically dampened significantly by the time it reaches the precapillary arterioles. In the diseased model, this of course is much different and can lead to a, a significant shear stress at the level of the distal vessel and perhaps worsening of also the distal process. Now on the left-hand side, you can see also that these uh, contributions, as I said, particularly wave reflection, which is an often overlooked component of uh, proximal vessel stiffening. Now, we've known for a long time through works of Penne and Forey, as well as Lasky and others, that in experimental situations, if the uh, afterload, the pulmonary vascular resistance of, of a model is elevated, that the compliance of the pulmonary circulation it uh, plays a lot to do with buffering as well as maintenance of stroke work. What we also know is that when we look at uh, coupling, 
and and I will say this is not coupling from the traditional perspective, as Dr. Hirt said, necessarily, but coupling of flow to impedance. And I'll I'll spare you all the impedance spectra and and whatnot, uh, as as in, unless of course you want to talk about that afterwards, but. It, it looks like as if the, in the normal circulation that peak flow occurs in the, er, in the um, low impedance uh, harmonics, which is typically also where the first minimum or the, the, the low impedance occurs as well. Now, in, the, uh, in these models, the proximal vessels, particularly the vessels down to the uh, segmental arteries are the vessels which determine this. So therefore, it is important, I believe, in the flow impedance matching to have uh, or maintain pulmonary vascular uh, compliance. Now, I'm particularly interested in drug mechanisms, and I think that uh, perhaps uh, some of us may have uh, different opinions as to what the current FDA drugs uh, uh, may do to the pulmonary circulation. Uh, and what I do or would stand out to say is that the, the current FDA approves therapies, the majority of evidence out there indicates that they are not substantially disease modifying. So if that is the case, then of course, the change in pulmonary vascular resistance once a patient is placed on therapy, has to be a different mechanism than the change in pulmonary vascular resistance as the disease gets worse. And we can get into that as to why that may, may happen. That's outside the scope of this talk. But, but suffice it to say, in that context, although PVR is dropping, it is also, I think, important to look at the pulmonary vasculature and how stiffening may improve a patient's right ventricular function when placed on therapy. Dr. Von Nordegraff already showed this wonderful study that was done years ago and um, has illustrated, I believe, the complexities behind this uh, relationship in that at a given change in PVR as a patient's placed on therapy, there is a significant heterogeneity in RV function. Now, of course, one possible explanation for that is the RV is intrinsically sick. Um, and, and that is, I think, accumulating evidence as indicated in scleroderma, that is probably the case. Uh, however, if we examine the relationship of afterload as well, there are a couple possibilities that may exist. One is that postal loading is variable, which we have to get around this consistency of the RC time, which I, I will elaborate upon. The other is that, that the RV, depending it's on, upon its state, is uh, uh, affected differently by compliance, depending upon how severe the pulmonary stiffening is. So coming back to the, the uh, RC time curve, as you can see, in this depiction uh, of, of uh, say, two patients, one who has a change at time, B, or at, you know, I would say, time B versus time A, we all know that the patient for, uh, A would benefit more from, from uh, therapy. Uh, in that context, of course, both uh, PVR is low and compliance is changing significantly, whereas patient B would not substantially benefit from the case of especially compliance as there's a very small incremental change in compliance. But the, what the curve doesn't illustrate is how is, well, under, under the assumption that, that pulmonary vascular resistance matters more to patient B than A perhaps, is the underlying premise that the right ventricle will respond the same way uh, to, to changes in compliance from uh, uh, compliance B to compliance A. But I would submit to you that, that the evidence indicates that that is not the case. If we look at uh, cross-sectional data from Dr. Sands, uh, this is published quite a few years ago now, he looked at different 
uh, metrics of pulmonary vascular stiffness, one can see that this relationship is not linear, that in low compliance range, that there is a, a uh, more substantial change in RVEF than at the high compliance end. In fact, there was two times uh, contribution of uh, compliance changes to RV stroke work than there was pulmonary vascular <laughs> resistance. We also know that in work from uh, Dr. Uh, Hirt and Singh, as well as Systrom, that the uh, contractile reserve is closely related to compliance as the patient uh, exercises. And then we also can't get around all the data that has been published with regard to mortality and compliance. And I've just put one sample study there, which is probably the largest to date, looking uh, which Drs. Leopold and Marin were part of, uh, showing that compliance is a key factor in mortality across different forms of pulmonary hypertension. So we embarked on a uh, uh, study to look at the integration of uh, cardiac MRI exercise data as well as, uh, uh, um, uh, in, in, I'm sorry, as uh, invasive cardiopulmonary exercise testing. We uh, looked at the, the changes in um, different afterload parameters and how they affect the right ventricle over time. So patients were incident were treatment naive, 63 of which underwent uh, serial uh, invasive CPET, um, MRI, uh, and catheterization. These were matched to 62 controls from the pulmonary vascular uh, phenomics, the PVDomics project. And then we, we first identified those who would have what, we, what I would consider as a prequel to reverse remodeling. We looked at RVEF, we looked at RV and diastolic volume, we looked at um, RV and systolic volume, and uh, looked at that relative to exercise um, uh, data as well as uh, outcome, and found uh, of those that RV and diastolic volume was the most predictive of those metrics over time, the changes in volume. And if we uh, examined that, we came with a, uh, a reduction in, in 15 milliliters per minute, which incidentally has been shown to be prognostic by the group in Sheffield on an independent study. About 35% of these patients were um, classified as responders. And we looked at the different metrics which, pred which predicted response. Of those, we looked at mean PA pressure, we looked at uh, RV elastance, I'm sorry, um, pulmonary artery elastance, uh, where the uh, RV and uh, RV peak RV and systolic pressure was the uh, and used as the uh, as the end systolic pressure, and we showed that uh, as well as mean pressure and PVR, and we showed that pulmonary compliance was the most predictive. Now, if, if we look at uh, an unpublished um, subset of this analysis where these patients, uh, uh, we can show uh, vec these vector plots. The uh, arrow, the tail of the arrow is the baseline uh, measurement and the, uh, the arrow head is the follow-up measurement. We can show relative to RVEF. Of course, as you can see by the plot on the left, that patients who even started out with compliances less than one and ended with compliances less than one had substantial improvements in RVEF. So this not only shows uh, similar to what SANS has shown in a cross-sectional basis, but also longitudinally. Now, how do we know that compliance is affected by the proximal arteries. Well, it's not necessarily. Compliance is affected by the distal arteries. But I believe that there is an explanation for as to why the proximal arteries may, may en enhance RVPA coupling and RV uh, pressure, uh, I'm sorry, RV improvements. Again, if we look at the low, uh, uh, the low frequency harmonics, uh, uh, Z1 and Z2 on the impedance spectrum, uh, these are determined primarily by wave reflection as well as the, the proximal vasculature. We can see a, a relationship, a more uh, significant, a significant relationship between um, 
compliance, which is the, the top uh, as uh, relative to pulmonary vascular resistance. So therefore, the proximal vasculature appears to be related, at least in some respects, to total compliance. So moving on to wave reflection as to how this may, be, may affect within the context of, say, a uh, RV function, within the context of a, um, a, an RC time, which is constant, as RC time does not measure directly wave reflection, we can say that uh, wave reflection is, does influence also pulmonary vascular coupling and pulmonary and uh, RV mass. This uh, study uh, was um, uh, published by the uh, uh, Amsterdam group, uh, I believe, uh, in 2022 which uh, measured uh, MRI flow uh, as well as pressure to uh, develop impedance spectra and showed that as uh, uh, wave return is earlier, the uh, RV structure is affected. This uh, is also um, affecting diastolic wall tension and RVPA uncoupling has also been uh, documented uh, as related to in, a, in separate studies uh, by Dr. Singh and here, uh, as well as um, uh, Dr. Bellafori uh, at Naomi Chesler's lab. These, the, the, this uncoupling uh, is the uh, coupling ratio, which is uh, determined methods, as uh, Dr. Here just uh, elaborated upon. So can, tr is there evidence that, that uh, treatment can actually affect the structure of the proximal vessels? Um, you know, it's, it's quite difficult to find that in the literature, but there is some evidence, as you can see from these good old fashioned wedge angiograms on the top, that um, IV prostacyclin uh, can influence the structure of the proximal vessels. On the left, you can see a patient with proximal arterial uh, uh, pruning, as well as a decreased capillary blush, Whereas on the right, the same patient after, um, I believe it was 12 weeks of epoprostenol, showed in, in significant improvements in the proximal vessels as well as um, uh, the capillary blush on angiography. And if we look at the same uh, study I previously showed uh, from the Amsterdam group, the changes in, in RV mass uh, as well were related to, uh, to waves. To, uh, to a delay in waves during, uh, during diastole or late systole, which is, uh, of course, beneficial in that case when the RV is not ejecting. I believe it's important that we then acknowledge that when we look at RVPA coupling longitudinally, that there is significant heterogeneity, especially early on in the disease when patients are uh, sick. This is a, a, actually based upon several studies of ours which have been published on, with single beat methods longitudinally from MR and, and uh, catheterization. And in, in this figure for, published from a longitudinal cohort which was followed up over approximately a year, we showed that the diastolic stiffness was uh, one of the early phase improvements in uh, RV function and that RVEF was depend improvements in RVEF by the first follow-up were dependent more on diastolic function than they were necessarily based upon cup, uh, RVPA coupling. And we can get around, uh, discuss the mechanisms as to why this could be, but my, my point here is that we have to then relate the improvements in RVEF uh, potentially to the changes in proximal vessels during diastole. So how, how could that occur? And this is just a hypothesis I have. So if you could follow my logic, then that uh, patients who have high diastolic um, volumes, of course, vis-a-vis -vis the law of Laplace, have higher end diastolic stiffness. We have shown previously um, that the wave reflection affects diastolic stiffness, that end diastolic volume is begin systolic volume, and that therefore patients who have a more dilated ventricle may have a difficult 
uh, or, or RVPA uncoupling during early systole. Now, I believe also, of course, then suffice it to say, patients who have a more robust response to therapy, perhaps that 35% I alluded to earlier, may have an improvement uh, or a more dramatic improvement in RVPA coupling, therefore linking perhaps wave reflection with diastolic function and diastolic uh, um, stiffening of the right ventricle. So my key points today are that the proximal PA uh, stiffening is playing a part in the pathophysiology of the distal vasculature as well as the RVPA coupling and perhaps diastolic function. Wave reflection from the prox proximal PA can account for some of these differences. And perhaps PA compliance should be thought of not necessarily in terms of where we are on the PVR curve, but as a standalone independent metric of improvement. PA compliance can represent an isolated therapeutic target, perhaps outside of PVR, um, although it, a lot of research needs to be done to determine um, how we can actually do that. Um, I know Dr. Leopold is going to present some, some data on a device, which I believe uh, can, can assist us with that. And that's it. Thank you very much, everyone. Next up, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Indy Singh, who's the uh, director of the uh, Pulmonary Vascular Disease Program at Yale, a graduate of the Burke Fellowship in Pulmonary Heart Disease. And um, he's here to speak with us today about uh, the other side of the pulmonary circulation, the small vessels. Uh, thanks, Brad. So I'm here to make the case that the action resides in the small vessels. So I have no financial disclosures and um, here are the focus of my, my presentation. So I'll first discuss the, the you know, pathognomonic findings of small vessel disease in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. I'll then discuss the different afterload, RV afterload measures that are manifested by small vessel disease. And then we'll discuss the implications of the small vessel disease across the different pH types. And finally, uh, discuss the implication of small vessel disease on, on dynamic right ventricular function. So pathologically, pulmonary arterial hypertension is defined by, by small vessel in, uh, involvement. So if you see the slides here from A to H, they describe uh, small vessel involvement. So slides A and B demonstrate thickening of the intima and media Slide C describes the, the you know, classic onion skin-like thickening of the intima with a pinhole opening into the, into the vessel lumen. Slide D demonstrate the muscularization of the small artery. E and F is the classically described plexiform lesions. And then slide G and H demonstrate the angiomatoid lesions that you see in the small vessels along with small vessel thrombi. So we had a pretty extensive talk earlier about, about lung transplantation in, 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 in pulmonary arterial hypertension. So when you um, uh, perform a lung transplant, the native right lung, the main PA and the right PA um, is, is, is then anastomosed to, uh, to, the, to the, uh, for, uh, for the, the recipient lung is anastomosed to the donor lung. And once you once you replace the small vessel disease, you get not only an immediate improvement in right ventricular function by TEE parameters, but you actually get a sustained improvement in RV ejection fraction and various other cardiac MRI parameters uh, up to three years uh, down the line. So next, let's focus on the, the manifestations of the small vessel disease and, and what the implications are clinically. So the different afterload measure that, that that, that is able to capture small vessel disease include compliance, resistance, and, and this third 
um, hemodynamic variable called palmy vascular distensibility. So th this was described earlier by Dr. Richard, where using cardiac MRI and right heart catheterization, um, you know, the group here was able to uh, determine what the local compliance are that resides within the main PA, right and left uh, uh, palmy arteries as well, by determining what the change of area divided by the change of pressure uh, multiplied by the vessel length. And they found that the local compliance significantly correlated to the overall lung compliance determined by the uh, uh, pulse pressure method. And these local this, this, the summation of this local compliance made up only about 20% of the, of the compliance. So the majority of the compliance resides in the distal vasculature. And compliance is a very important prognostic marker in PAH. You know. um, this is a study you know, in 2015 that demonstrated that compliance proved to be a better discriminator for survival compared to other hemodynamic variables. This study that was Dr. Richard mentioned earlier was a very recent study, large study um, that demonstrated a protective association with all cause mortality, uh, beginning at a compliance of greater than three, and the strongest association was actually seen in patients with precapillary disease. PVR um, is also an important prognostic marker in palmy hypertension. While it may not carry the same prognostic significance compared to the other variables, it does confer prognostic um, significance in, in patients with COPD, in patients with CTEF, and patients with HEFPEF in an abnormal palmy vascular response or, or those with combined pre and post capillary palmy hypertension. And just below there is the equation for the palmy vascular resistance, which is the transpalmary gradient divided by the cardiac output. So, P, and high PVR uh, it predicts mortality in patients with COPD. So, uh, this is a study of about 139 patients, COPD patients, more than 50 of them were male. What they found was that amongst all the different hemodynamic parameters, a PVR greater than five was the best, uh, provided the best prognostic cutoff uh, compared to the other uh, conventional hemodynamic uh, markers. They also showed that a PVR greater than five had a worse exercise capacity uh, manifested by a, a lower six minute walk distance, lower peak exercise aerobic capacity, higher BNP compared to those, those with lower PVR. And so the authors concluded that an elevated PVR is a hallmark for severe palmy vascular disease in patients with COPD. And in patients with CTEF, you know, the, the, the abnormal PVR relative to the thromboembolic burden uh, uh, may explain why you know, these folks have significant small vessel disease. And the thought is that the, this small vessel vasculopathy uh, develops because of, of this high flow scenario, either from um, a high flow immediate vasculopathy from systemic collaterals, or in this uh, uh, hypothetical image here shows that in the non-obstructed vessel, you have increased flow from, from the obstructed vessel uh, stimulating a, a, a vasculopathy that pathologically mirrors that of palmy arterial hypertension, as I showed you in, in, in the earlier slide. And it is it's also responsible for the persistent palmy hypertension that we see following uh, thromboanotrectomy. Um, so in, in about 800 patients following PTE, uh, the group in, in the UK identified a mean P of greater than 38 and a PVR greater than 5.3. Uh, that was associated with increased mortality. So <clears throat> I'm going to end in, to talk. I'm going to end the uh, talk to briefly discuss um, what the implications of the small vessel disease are on on dynamic right ventricular function. And we'll start by introducing the concept of pulmonary vascular distensibility. So earlier I showed what the what the uh, equation for PVR is, which is the transpulmonary gradient divided by the cardiac output. So if you were to rearrange this equation, you would assume that the, as the mean PA pressure increases, uh, as your cardiac output increases, your mean PA pressure should increase linearly. But instead, the relationship is actually a curvilinear relationship. So there's, a, there's a, actually a fourth variable that attenuates this increase, and this is the, the alpha of the or pulmonary vascular distensibility. It's defined as a percent change in vessel diameter for a given transmural pressure change. 
It occurs prior to elevations in, in resting mean pulmonary arterial pressure or pulmonary vascular resistance. And, that, and it's, more it's a more dynamic measure than the conventional measures, and I'll, I'll, I'll describe that in, in, a, in a second. And you, you solve uh, uh, the, the alpha here by inputting various flow and pressure uh, measures during incremental exercise. Um, so you, you, you derive the mean PA pressure, the wedge pressure, the cardiac output, and the, the total pulmonary resistance. And you, you solve by you solve the, the this equation here, and you derive the the, the pulmonary vascular distensibility value as such. And so it has to be done during incremental exercise, and that's how you get the the um, the, the various pressure and flow uh, flow uh, values. So along with that, if you have a metabolic cord and an arterial line in addition to the swan, you're able to you're able to sw solve for, for the CA VO2 difference and derive a fixed cardiac output, which then you, you can then derive during incre incremental exercise what the only vascular extensibility is. Come on, one more minute. We're almost and what we found was that it, it's, a, it's an early predictor of pulmonary vascular dysfunction. Um, Compare it to, to, to other hemodynamic markers, you know, resting compliance, delta compliance, rest, delta meaning rest to peak compliance change, peak compliance, resting, comp, resting PVR, um, peak PVR, the, the pulmonary vascular distensibility was, was a much more sensitive hemodynamic marker for, for early disease. And we also showed that it's a, it's a very useful um, marker for disease progression. So if you look at, at this, the slide right here, it shows that from, from controls to HEFPEF to folks with exercise pulmonary hypertension um, to the group with PAH, there's a steady decrement in, in the distensibility. We, in addition to showing that alpha was associated with a, with a depressed peak exercise aerobic capacity, we also showed that early uh, Im impediment of distensibility was associated with a dynamic right ventricular pulmonary arterial coupling uh, during exercise across the different pulmonary hypertension phenotypes. PVR is also very important in left-sided heart disease. So in, in this study, we compared the different phenotypes of patients with HEFPEF, those uh, with, um, who develop an abnormal pulmonary vascular response during exercise and those who do, do, did not develop an abnormal pulmonary vascular response during exercise. And what we found was that in, 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 in patients with HEFPEF with an abnormal pulmonary vascular response, the degree of, of uh, uncoupling was much more significant compared to controls and, 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 and the HEFPEF only group. So to summarize, you know, small vessel disease pathologically defines pulmonary arterial hypertension Small vessel disease impacts clinical outcomes across the different pH uh, spectrum. Uh, dynamic assessment of small vessel disease can help unmask early pulmonary vascular disease. And you know, PAH targeted therapy should be focused on reverse remodeling of the, of the small vessel vasculopathy. So my thanks to the group here, the group back at Yale and, and elsewhere. And this is Yale, thanks. Thanks, uh, indeed. Um, irrespective of whether the problem is in the proximal or the distal part, the best, uh, best way to improve the patient is to uh, in, uh, reduce the afterload very much. And it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, which is Eileen Harder. Eileen, I heard that you are the new faculty, a star uh, next to Aaron. Great to have you here. The title of the presentation is to bring it up. Yeah. It is severe reduction in afterload. Okay. Eileen, now we are real okay. can enter. Okay, sorry for Thank the technical you. glitch. Um, okay, so I am fin I have the honor and privilege of finishing this last day with a very clinical talk um, and a wonderful panel of clinicians and also physiologists here. Um, and I'll be talking today about clinical implications of aggressive RV afterload reduction. So this will be in some time in some parts a little repetitive on things that have already been touched on, but we'll try to use this approach to integrate across multiple lectures that we saw today. I have no disclosures. 
This is a very brief outline of what we're going to go over. We're going to very, very briefly review RV afterload, recognizing that this was already covered in phenomenal and excellent detail today. We'll talk about current risk stratification schemes, and then we'll spend the bulk of this lecture focused on right heart reverse remodeling, how it correlates with RV function, how we can use it in clinical practice uh, before we conclude. So as we've heard repeatedly today, the RV is the major determinant of morbidity and mortality in PAH. And really, apart from in select situations, PVR has not been considered to be a traditional indicator of prognosis, particularly of mortality. Um, and instead, we've really iterated towards this concept that we use risk scores in PAH to understand prognosis and to guide therapy. And when we look at risk scores and we try to use them to understand how patients do, what we see is that an early achievement of a low risk status looks like it should be a key priority of PAH therapy. Um, and this is data from the Swedish registry where they looked at baseline and at first follow-up. And I'll just uh, sidebar myself to say this was pre-advent really to the four strata risk score at follow-up, but we'll look at that next. Um, but what we see is that low risk is here in blue. Um, and we can see obviously, not surprisingly, low risk correlates with better mortality than those who are intermediate or even those who are at high risk both at baseline and follow-up. But what we get the sense from, from looking at this figure is that the transitions between risk statuses or risk classifications, not surprisingly, have uh, clinical implications, such that those patients who either remain low risk or improve to a low risk category have much better outcomes than those who do not, or unfortunately, who worsen from a low risk status. And so we get the under we already kind of start to understand that we can uh, understand risk status using some of the parameters that we we have, and we'll talk a little bit further along about how we can potentially even make this better. And when we look at what is in risk calculators, really they focus largely on clinical variables. There's some hemodynamics included in some. There's some echocardiographic parameters included in some, but really the common thread going through them is functional class, six-minute walk distance, and NT, pro and PE, all of which are very helpful but very clinical markers. And in particular, with the intermediate risk uh, class, we really struggle with how well they do and how we can understand what happens to them, because these patients have very heterogeneous outcomes. And unfortunately, this is where most of the patients fall. So this is data from the Compare Registry. Dr. Hooper is here, uh, which is amazing. And this was his paper and his work that he did with his team. And what they saw is using uh, risk status, most patients are low risk, or intermediate risk, excuse me, at baseline but they also remain intermediate risk of follow-up. And this really led to the advent of this concept that we should be using a four-tier risk stratification at follow-up, such that we better tweeze apart the intermediate risk category, because not surprisingly, some are intermediate low and favor more of a low risk profile, whereas some are intermediate high and favor more of a high risk profile. And this translates into mortality benefits. Uh, I changed my slides this morning, so I had to change the color of this figure, and it's not very nice looking. But so green-ish is low risk, yellow is intermediate to low risk, this one is intermediate to high, and then this kind of dark reddish color is high risk. And so we can see that using a four risk tier, mortality really nicely uh, parses apart. And when we think about RV afterload, this is a very simplistic overview of what was reviewed earlier uh, by my amazing colleagues. But essentially, when we talk about RVPA coupling, we're describing how well the RV adapts to the afterload mismatch, which is the primary pathophysiology in pH and PAH. And we, as we said previously, the RV goes through a series of changes that we're not going to belabor here. But essentially, we see an increase in contractility before the RV starts to dilate. Sometimes we develop functional TR, and this worsens this propagation cycle of RV dilation and dysfunction. Um, and when we get to a certain point, really, coupling goes away, and we start to see things like ventricular dyssynchrony, reduced cardiac output, and we start to call that the picture of RV failure. And when we think about RV changes in pH, again, Dr. Hurt summarized this so nicely, uh, as did all of my colleagues, sorry. Um, but so we can try to get some limited uh, metrics of RV function from right heart cath. We can try to understand preload with uh, mean RIP. We can try to understand afterload, you know, and whether we use PVR or compliance, I think, is, is uh, an interesting point of discussion. Um, whether some think, can we use PAP even? Uh, we can try 
try to get a sense of contractility by understanding stroke volume. And importantly, and as Dr. Hurt discussed in much better detail than I am saying, we can we have a couple measures to estimate RVPA coupling, which are of course potentially not as good as the multi-beat method. Um, but we can start to get a sense of uh, how we can either use a pressure or a volume directed measurement to try to get a sense of how well the RV function matches the PA. And that should say RV, I apologize, guys. And Dr. Vonk Nordegraff already mentioned this today, but I think this is a really important study in that RV changes precede clinical deterioration. And what him and his group saw is that um, the RV and diastolic volume and end systolic volume really kind of heralds a potential clinical decline. And these figures didn't come out quite as nicely, but here we see this patient who group who ultimately decompensates as compared to the group who remains clinically stable. And clearly their RV and diastolic and end systolic volumes start to increase far before their PVR or cardiac output does. And so we start to get this sense too that changes in functional class and in exercise capacity may not herald clinical decline despite our use of them in these risk calculators. And in long-term survivors and patients who are stable for a number of years, five years in this study, we might actually get the sense that clinical and hemodynamic, this apparent stability, might actually be masking development and subtle progression of RV failure. And what we see is that as the RV ejection fraction and uh, SV over S, ESV fall, coupling falls, um, ventricular volumes and contractility understandably must increase to maintain stroke volume. And this is a graph of RVEF. This is a graph of the measure of coupling. The red lines are denoting where uh, the ventricular volumes will have to start to increase to maintain that stroke volume. And when even just looking at the graphs, we get a sense of that we might be able to use these even in different situations such that coupling might be more useful for early or, or early or moderate RV failure, whereas RVF, we can see that very small changes in RVF are translating to large changes in clinical volume, or in, in uh, ventricular volume, very akin to the RC time constant curve. Um, and in this case, maybe we're better looked, this might be better suited to late RV failure. And so when we start to think further past the risk calculators about what should be the priority for the RV and what should be the priority for our treatment approach to it, what we get the sense of is that, like we said before, it's really the maladaptive RV that's the major determinant for prognosis in PAH. And inherently, the development of RV failure in this condition must cause RV dimensions that increase, uh, even in the absence, like we saw, of unchanged hemodynamics or potentially even unchanged exercise capacity. And so when we start thinking Thinking about treatment, and again, this is very simplistic and not obviously to the level of Dr. Hurd, but what we see is that maybe we can focus on shifting RVPA coupling back by targeting some of these metrics in these uh, coupling uh, parameters. And so there's been a suggestion that maybe specific priorities to help recover RV function should include one, reversing RV dimensions back to normal, and two, whether there may be utility in reducing mean PAP. But we'll spend most of this time talking about RV dimensions. Um, and this, we can call this early and robust RV afterload reduction to meet pressure resistance thresholds. As has already been mentioned today, uh, we can try to extrapolate from other literature to PAH, and specifically after thromboendarterectomy, we can see that there's an immediate improvement in RV size and function. Um, and this is a graph, or this is a table of uh, correlation coefficients shown here first, p-values are second, and these are diastolic and systolic RV mass measurements obtained from cardiac MRI after th three months after the endarterectomy. And what we see actually is that what correlates best with these changes in these parameters is actually hemodynamic measurements, not so much six minute walk distance, which I think is interesting. And when we look further to lung transplant, like Dr. Sharma talked about today, we can see very rapid and sustained recovery of the RV after lung transplant in these patients. And that typically is what we see. And there's been some interesting older research in patients who underwent single lung transplant and then had the uh, remaining lung re-examined upon their passing, but that there was actually regression of microvasculopathy in that treated lung that coincided with normalization of their hemodynamics. 
And so we start to move towards this concept of right heart reverse remodeling, which is what we are essentially talking about today. And really, while it can, and which I think is is pretty self-explanatory in that it's the right heart returning back to its normal uh, shape structure. Um, and while a consensus definition is lacking, there's been a lot of interest in this area. And so suggested components uh, that we can debate about whether they are the most appropriate components, um, but have so far included RV and diastolic area, right atrial area, and the LV eccentricity index. And I say potentially RV fractional area change because really that's a better marker of function, not so much remodeling, although the two often go hand in hand as I think we've heard about today. And so I thought this was a really beautiful figure from the Blue Journal published last year, uh, where essentially they looked at what are the hemodynamic changes by treatment type offered. And I'll walk you guys through it just because I know some of this is probably hard to read. But so the group in this kind of like purple blue uh, got upfront dual combination therapy with an ERA and a PDE5. And everybody else between this neon green and navy got some sort of parenteral prostacyclin. So these patients got upfront parenteral prostacyclin monotherapy. These patients got it as part of a dual regimen, and these patients got it as part of a triple combination therapy. And not surprisingly, their hemodynamic improvements were the best. And so translating that forward to the guidelines, what we saw in the guidelines published last year is that really in those patients who are lower intermediate risk at diagnosis, uh, initial combination therapy with a PD-5 and an ERA is recommended. And for those patients who are high risk and who are good candidates uh, able to tolerate a prostacyclin, uh, really that it's triple therapy with such a drug is what should be considered. And looking now at how does right heart reverse remodeling translate into treatment regimens, what we saw in Ambition is that upfront combination therapy was associated with a significantly reduced risk of clinical worsening. And so in 2017 or so, a group in Italy took it one step further and they said, we know that the clinical worsening is, is, be is better, but how can we understand what happens to the right heart with this therapy? And so within a cohort of idiopathic PAH patients who were treatment naive, they looked at how do hemodynamics change and then how does this change in correspondence with their echo. Um, and what they saw is that despite a pretty good median PVR reduction of 37%, only 50% reached a low risk status and about 50% did not reach a low risk status. And when they looked at what predicted reaching a low risk status, it was either a reduction in PVR of 50% or more or a preserved stroke volume index or a relative change in stroke volume index, which is shown in this figure here, and it's a little bit hard to unpack, but green denotes a reveal, so for those who can't see, sorry, green denotes a reveal risk score under seven, orange, or yellow, sorry, is uh, seven to eight, and then red is greater than eight. And what we see here is that the delta PVR, this is less than, this is greater than 50% reduction in PVR. Clearly most of these dots look green. Um, and then the same thing with the stroke volume index. And those patients who were able to achieve both, you know, tended to have reached a low risk strat status. And looking further to triple combination therapy, I think probably everybody here is very familiar with this incredible study done out of the French registry in 2021, where they saw that patients who were initiated on upfront triple com combination therapy containing a prostacyclin had much better outcomes, despite having more severe disease at baseline. And here what they saw is that at baseline, essentially no patients had all low risk criteria, and actually the majority of their cohort had zero low risk criteria. But by by the time of first follow-up, approximately 40% had met all of these parameters, which is really incredible and truly remarkable. And this translated to survival benefits. Uh, so this first is high-risk patients, and clearly there's a marked survival improvement in those patients who got triple therapy compared to a dual or monotherapy, as shown here. And similar, but maybe a little less uh, impressive uh, changes, though, were seen in even those patients who were intermediate risk. And I know this has already been shown, so I won't belabor it, but in patients receiving triple therapy with a parenteral prostacyclin, what we start to see is that the degree of right heart reverse remodeling correlates with a reduction in PVR. As shown here, both uh, x-axes are the reduction in PVR. This shows the change in end diastolic area. And then over here, we see fractional area change. And clearly, this group in blue has a much, significant, has a much more significant improvement in both PVR, which 
corresponds with end diastolic area, corresponds with fractional area change. And this was clearly way more significant than those patients who were historically receiving monotherapy. And they, the group in Italy in a separate study looked further and said, how can we understand how receipt of different combination or therapeutic regimens uh, impacts one, hemodynamics, two, risk status, and three, the degree of right heart reverse remodeling. And what they saw, not surprisingly, and echoing what they saw in France, is that those patients who received an upfront prostacyclin containing but combination therapy strategy and who are high risk at baseline, a fairly good proportion portion, about more than 20%, were low risk at follow-up. Whereas we see those who were high risk at baseline got only monotherapy, had a really mixed response. And not surprisingly, this corresponded to hemodynamic improvements in PVR, mean PA pressure, and a host of others. And what they further looked at is uh, what are the changes in end diastolic area and what are the changes in function evidenced by fractional area change in these subsets. And again, so red here is upfront process prostacyclin containing combination therapy. Blue is monotherapy, and we can clearly see for fractional area change and end diastolic area, there's clearly a marked difference between these groups where there's a greater improvement in fractional area change, greater improvement in uh, end diastolic area, sorry, in, this, in these patients um, who receive this upfront combination prostacyclin containing therapy compared to those who are getting monotherapy. And I'll just draw your attention, I think it's interesting that that there was just a prostacyclin monotherapy group shown here with these black dots, which are hard to see, but when you look closely, they're essentially kind of scattered throughout. So they really didn't cluster with one uh, specific cohort. And when we start looking further to understand, what we see is that the degree of right heart reverse remodeling carries prognostic significance. And so this is, again, a cohort from, uh, of idiopathic PAH patients from a multicenter study in Italy. And what they defined the presence of right heart reverse remodeling at is at one year, and you had to have reductions in your end diastolic area or right atrial area or improvements in your LV centricity index. And what they saw is that at one year, PVR was the only independent predictor that right heart reverse remodeling had occurred. And what though what it looked like, though, was it looked like quite remarkable in terms of end diastolic area again, um, and in terms of right atrial area again. And now they took it a step further and said, how does this, does this correlate with clinical worsening? And so hard to see, and I'm sorry that it's so tiny, but uh, clinical worse, no clinical worsening is shown here in blue. Clinical worsening is in green. And so what we see is that those patients who tended to not have clinical worsening had much greater improvements in end diastolic area. And it really splits out nicely. And still fairly significant improvements in right atrial area. Um, and when they took it even one step further, what they saw is that recovery of RV systolic function most strongly protected against clinical worsening when this was associated with a simultaneous reduction in RV dimensions. So we get the sense that we've, like, like we've heard before that all parameters really are working hand in hand and and we might uh, it might be a little more complex to consider them all together but there's clearly benefit to considering them as a group um, and that's shown here Furthermore, they observed that the presence of right heart reverse remodeling carries actually pretty remarkable prognostic significance as such that it was an independent predictor of survival. And they designed what they called this right heart reverse remodeling score, where they based it on these three parameters. So these cutoffs here, the optimal cutoffs, they defined by receiver operating curve analysis. Um, but they, they added separate also cutoffs for a less of a response. And what they saw is that patients who met all three criteria, this degree of response, there was a significant uh, improvement in survival that extended out years past those who did not have such a profound imp uh, improvement in right heart remodeling. And further, and I think this is where things get even, I think it's all interesting, but I think this is really, really interesting because then they, in a separate analysis, they added right heart reverse remodeling to risk scores. And specifically, they added it to the full reveal score. And they said, can it improve our risk stratification of patients? And it actually pretty remarkably improves the risk stratification of patients. And this is particularly important for the low and the intermediate risk groups. So circling back, we're gonna start circling back to where we started at 
the beginning. And what they saw is that a reveal score of five to seven, so low risk to the beginning of the intermediate risk category, um, is shown here uh, in this, oh, I forgot to put the colors in. I'm sorry, when I changed slides. So, okay, so blue is a reveal risk score of five to seven. Red is a reveal risk score of eight to 12. And so what we can see is that there's huge divergence, even when the reveal risk score is actually pretty low. And these patients are diverging by the presence of right heart reverse remodeling, actually, <laughs> such that it's actually interesting that it's more comparable. Uh, the six less or five to seven versus eight to 12 is actually more comparable in terms of survival when you have the presence of right heart remodeling. And it's not so much that actually the reveal score is making a difference, but potentially whether this right heart reverse remodeling is contributing. And those patients, like we said, who have a low reveal risk score, but who do not have this degree of remodeling, do not have the same survival benefits. And as we saw, this is, a, I think, an amazing figure from a, one of the many amazing manuscripts uh, in this talk. But what we see is that the degree of right heart reverse remodeling, as we've discussed, follows a sigmoidal relationship to the reduction in the PVR. And your PVR really must decrease by 40 to 50 percent, 45 percent, before we start to see reductions in RV dimensions and in improvements in RVEF. But once you get to that very critical threshold of 45 percent, what we see is that from 45 five to 70% or so uh, reductions in PVR, you get very small, very large gains in your right heart reverse remodeling for very small changes in PVR. So once you hit that critical threshold, you really start seeing improvement. I know that Dr. Hooper and others are talking about SOTATERCEP tomorrow, and I know there's been some very minor discussion today, so I just one slide. Is there evidence for this in SOTATERCEP? And this was a really incredible post hoc study of Stellar that was recently published. Uh, and what was seen was that there were improvements beyond hemodynamics, and these occurred in markers of RV function, markers of RV coupling, and then again, like we've talked about, markers of right heart reverse remodeling. So potentially there is. So to kind of circle back to the beginning um, and to really uh, hammer it home, when we think about how does this fit into our cl current clinical situation, what we saw is that in this very elegant clustering study done in Italy, and I believe also by the University of Arizona, uh, what we see is that this RV phenotype is associated with worse outcomes, such that its presence, the presence of RV maladaptation, might be an opportunity for more personalized or directed therapy. And what the group did to find is that there were four clusters of idiopathic PAH patients, but cluster three in particular represented this cluster with very severe or severe pH, severe RV dilation, who were really not able to compensate for this degree of dilation. And when we start looking at parameters like we've talked about, you know, it's the RV and diastolic area, the end systolic area uh, that we see come back as being not unexpectedly higher in this group. And I think this is really important just to circle back one more time to the intermediate group because this group suffers from really heterogeneous outcomes, but also heterogeneous PAH treatment. And this was a really elegant study published out of Sweden in 2021, where they essentially looked at, they looked at a group of PAH patients of all risk statuses, and I've separated just the intermediate risk out here. But what they looked at is what happened to those intermediate risk patients, and then how did this coincide with treatment. And what we get the sense of is that most intermediate patients, like we've said, remain intermediate risk as they go along, probably the bulk of them. But when we look at how they're treated, it's really heterogeneous. It's it's really scattered. You know, a small group start on triple therapy and go through to triple therapy. These marks are de denoting year one, year two, year three. And so at year one, clearly a smaller or a larger population was escalated to triple therapy. But conversely, when we look, the majority of the cohort actually began on monotherapy. And when we look at year one, actually still a number continued on monotherapy until year two, at which point really then things started to tweeze out. But I think this really is an incredibly elegant way of showing that there is a lot of heterogeneity in what we do in this cohort. And we should be mindful of any other markers that, you know, we have a better four-tiered risk score, but we should be mindful of other markers that we can use to be continually improving our understanding of risk status here. 
And again, a separate study by the Italian group, but again, looking at the addition of uh, right heart remodeling to the reveal score. And this can be a little bit, it took me a little bit to get, but so what they look at is you, they looked at reveal score under six, and then the, separately, the presence of right heart reverse remodeling. And if you have a plus, that obviously means your reveal score was under six. And if you have a minus, your reveal score was greater than six. So what we see is that this line here in red, they had a low reveal risk score. They had a, uh, right heart remodeling at follow-up, and they have an incredible survival. The group in green had a high reveal score, or a higher than six at least, um, but they had right heart reverse remodeling, and their, their survival ticks along right in here, similar to that with the low risk score. Whereas those patients who had a lower reveal risk score, but who did not have right heart remodeling really kind of suffered. And when we think back to what the intermediate group looked like in survival at the beginning, we see that despite having a low reveal risk score, the survival actually almost looks like more like what we saw in the intermediate category. And so maybe there's an opportunity here for some addition to our risk stratification systems um, to help better guide therapy. And so in conclusion, as we've heard, right-sided dilation propagates RV failure. And there's been discussion about potentially PVR didn't, improve, didn't emerge as a predictor of clinical outcomes because there needs to be a very large reduction in PVR to achieve these morphologic and functional improvements in the RV. Upfront combination therapy, not surprisingly, has been shown time and time again to be associated with greater improvements in RV afterload. Monotherapy is rarely sufficient to achieve these goals, particularly as we've seen in that intermediate risk group. Um, and in turn, what we see is that greater reductions in RV afterload, those greater reductions in PVR are associated with the presence of right heart reverse remodeling, which in turn is associated with improved outcomes. And so potentially targeting afterload reduction, RV functional recovery more formally as part of our risk stratification may be a more comprehensive target. In addition, I'm not saying it should supplement the score entirely, but in addition to the score, maybe a complementary way to improve outcomes. Um, we should consider right heart cath if patients do not risk a low, or not, do not reach a low risk status, which I think is pretty self-explanatory, but particularly if there's a discrepancy between the risk status and what we're seeing on echo or cardiac MRI. And really we need to iterate towards a standardized definition. That's it. These are all the references, lots of them. I know I had to make the text small. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, I Eileen. I sit down there next to Indy. Yeah, come oh, on down. Yes. So to get the panel discussion started, I'm going to put the panelists on the spot a little bit. And, you know, over the course of the afternoon, we've heard a variety about um, traditional and both novel metrics of RV loading, um, RV-PA interaction, uh, both in a research and clinical context. And uh, if you had to predict um, five years from now, uh, what single integrative metric, in your opinion, do you think will emerge as a must-have for either a treatment target or, or clinical trial uh, endpoint? <laughs> Um, you might say, uh, you might think I'm going to say compliance, but uh, uh, I think probably uh, RV and diastolic volume on MRI. Thank you. Uh, no, no, I'm not part of this. Uh, okay. They've got there. Okay. As a single metric, I'd, I'd probably have to go with some sort of coupling metric myself, other than just which integrates other things together to generate. So it's more than a single single endpoint like end, end systolic volume. I would say uh, distensibility. Um, <laughs> it's an uh, early hemodynamic marker, impacts exercise capacity, uh, impacts RVPA coupling. I think I'm on the RV uh, and diastolic volume spectrum or coupling. I don't know. I'm going to give you each a vote. But Brad, you're starting off with like such a zinger of a question. Did you say end systolic or end diastolic volume? Diastolic. diastolic. Yeah, see, I, I would have thought maybe end systolic volume. Why do you think that? Why do you say that, Paul? So the data that were presented earlier today, yeah. 
really highlighted the importance of Penn Systolic Pond, which I hadn't really thought that much about before. Yeah. Yeah, there, is, there is a little bit of debate on the n diastolic foam or N-systolic foam. Actually, in the analysis, there are not so much differences. I'm a little bit in favor. I've done all my work on the n diastolic foam, but I'm still a bit in favor of the N-systolic foam. But the point is that it's sometimes difficult to assess, so the accuracy of the measurements is less, yeah. but physiological is more meaningful. Well, that gets to the question whether N-systolic volume is minimum volume which we run into a lot of the automated detection things when you look at a volume signal, it will pick out a point and says this is the end systolic volume. Yet if you watch the volume signal, it continues to fall after the point at what it defined. So we run into this whether we should use maximum and minimum or what a system defines as end systolic and end diastolic. So I, I don't know the <laughs> And that is also, again, to the fact that, that, that the pulmonary valve closed while the contraction is continuing. Yep, yep. absolutely. Mm -hmm. If there are any questions in the room, please go up yeah. to the microphone. Well, I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah. So, go ahead, and then we'll have a question. So, uh, my rationale. So, um, as I showed earlier, the, the RVPA coupling is very diverse early on in, in the therapeutic response. I believe what's happening there is that the um, heterometric autoregulation, the, the Starling response, is, is, um, is affected by reductions in afterload, and perhaps through the mechanisms I elaborated, uh, the, the, the RV um, and systolic volume then drops, and that's what's, that's what's causing an improvement in RVEF, but wall tension has not really dramatically changed until later on when the, the, the uh, RVPA coupling is more directly affected. That's, that's what I believe. So, so the transition from a healthy a disease to a healthier ventricle is, is magnified by the change in diastolic volume, not in systolic volume. May, may I a little bit explain this? Because it might be, uh, for, I don't know whether this is clear to everybody, but if I'm allowed to, to explain. Yes. Yes. <laughs> at, the, at the point when the right ventricle meets its highest pressure, of, at its highest volume, it provides the highest wall stress. That is end, end diastolic volume. And also the reason why reflected waves matter, and that's also, I, I, I agree with Franz on that point very much, is at the reflected waves, when they are proximal, they arrive early on, so very much on the end diastolic volume. So if the, the ventricle is large and the pressure is high, then that, this, this matters the, 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 the wall tension most. And systolic volume, at that moment, the pressure is low, so it doesn't matter. So in terms of stress of the right ventricle, it is all about the anti-systolic volume and uh, peak systolic pressure, so the early waves reflected. So question from Nick Rahagi. Um, having this expert panel, I, I cannot resist asking this question. So I think there is a significant drive to use the word remodeling, and I think a lot of people mentioned and touched upon this in your talks. Um, I, I guess my question to each of you is, what is remodeling of the right ventricle mean to you? And specifically, what does reverse remodeling mean? And I say that because for me, I always thought about remodeling as you know, fundamentally altering the, at a molecular and histological level, the makeup of the, the ventricle on the one extreme where I lived, uh, whereas in the other extreme, you could say diuresing someone with Lasix leads to reverse remodeling of the RV. So I'll, I'll start with that and see what each of you guys think about that. Well, start down there. That's a very interesting question, Nick. Uh, and I am sure that my response will not be as physiologically well thought out as the rest of the speakers on this panel. But essentially what I heard your question was, was what would your optimal definition of right heart reverse remodeling be? Do you need to see a histopathologic change or is an improved dimension on echocardiography enough? I mean, I think if you look at the studies of they're looking just for an improved dimension, and of course nobody's going and offering 
right ventricular biopsies on these patients. Um, you know, and I think even if you were to biopsy these patients, I don't know how much change you would actually see when you had the biopsy done. Um, I would say that I would personally, I would think that if you have a PAH patient on vasodilators and you see a sustained improvement in RV dimensions, that should be enough to say at least you have reverse RV remodeling. I think, I don't know. Paul, you're kind of shaking your head. Not shaking your head, but you're saying, I don't know. I mean, but I think that right now, personally, I think that right now as a field, that's kind of where we are in the clinical setting. And so I think to some degree, we are limited in the clinical setting by like what tools we have. And so we have cardiac MR, we have echo. You know, if you have an incredible physiologist, you can go to the cath lab and measure RVPA coupling. But at this point, you know, it's not really feasible, you know, and maybe there will be a role in the future, glucose metabolism, you know, like we heard Dr. Yu talk about this morning. I think we're iterating towards something much better, but I think right now we're very limited in terms of what we have. I don't know. Yeah, I was kind of thinking the same thing. I, I tend to think of it as being structural and molecular in terms of reverse remodeling. The reference for that is in the LVAD literature where there are studies going back to 2000 showing when you unload the left ventricle with a VAD, it actually not only structurally remodels, but it remodels in a molecular sense that calcium cycling recovers and, and the contractile force of individual myocytes. But you're right, I don't know how you're gonna do that. I know. How you're gonna biopsy. I mean, those are, you know, people come after having a VAD in for several months, come to be transplanted, you can mm -hmm. take, take all the tissue you want. That's not the option you got for the heart, I'd say. Yeah, your definition is much better. Yeah, I agree. I think. <laughs> I think from a molecular level, I think with the molecular, the, the uh, metabolic imaging will be the best way to, to assess if there's been uh, any changes uh, from a molecular level. Um, I don't think it's feasible to biopsy these patients. Um, I don't know if you'll see absolute regression, Nick. Is that what you're asking from RV hypertrophy from? Um, yeah. I think the, the, at least the, from the armory of tools that we have right now, perhaps probably you know, there's improvement in, in metabolic imaging modalities. That would, that would be a, an evidence of reverse remodeling from a molecular level. Can I actually just add one more point to, my, to everybody else's incredible points? I also think that potentially what's happening in the pulmonary vasculature and the remodeling that goes on there might even be more pertinent when we're talking about the concept. I think we're talking about the concept of reverse right heart remodeling in terms of clinical outcomes, but really that's reflecting what's gone on in the pulmonary vasculature, that you've probably improved afterload there to such a degree, of course, right, that you're seeing it reflected in your RV. So I personally, I think the really interesting question right at this time that has, of course, been of a lot of debate, and I won't like open the Pandora's box, but is what is happening in the pulmonary vasculature and what is the reverse remodeling going on there? And I think you almost need that to say, yes, the heart, because like we said, lessons from transplant, lessons from PTE, the RV should improve, but it's really what has happened in the pulmonary system. Sorry. I would add to that, um, Doctor, what Dr. Heard said, but when, he, when we looked at our MRI cohort, um, what, what we saw is near, we had 62 match controls in that cohort with MRI and exercise capacity. What we saw is that the, the patients, although they reached near normalization of RV volumes, their mass was still high in the, even in the, what we call reverse remodeling cohort. Um, and during exercise, their pressure flow loops were actually trended towards a higher slope or a higher pressure volume or pressure flow at exercise. Um, so obviously we can get into some, some discussions as to what that means with afterload, but I would suggest or say to you that I think that reverse remodeling is not only a change in, in molecular structure of the heart, but it's a change in, in RV mass, as well as the ability to handle, handle stress, for the RV to respond to stress. Um, and uh, as, as it would when it normalizes or normative changes occurs. So um, hopefully we'll learn more with uh, the spectra study with the, um, you know, the uh, d potential disease modification there as we're um, looking to, to see what happens with MRI of the cetatercept and, and exercise capacity. Okay. 
Hi. Does any change in, I think it's proteonomics that's going to tell us, but um, does anybody think we're ready to change how we approach patients based on the separation, the lumping, and the splitting? Um, or do we have enough patients followed for long enough to actually say, you only needed to be treated with two drugs? Or are we still at the point we just are seeing that there were significant differences by adding an additional drug? Are, are we just being, are we at any point where any of this makes any difference or do we just keep throwing drugs or devices at people because each one seems to do a little bit better and move a small percentage of people in some direction? So. I see, before you answer that, I wanted to add to that because I'm always struck by those survival curves that Eileen showed that it didn't matter if you got mono or dual therapy, the outcomes are the same. Yet patients on triple therapy do worlds better. So why aren't we starting everyone in a chemotherapeutic approach with three drugs or soon more drugs and then tailor therapy back? based on some index of either pulmonary vascular remodeling or right ventricular functional remodeling. So yeah, that's my point also. You know, Hodgkin's disease didn't become a curable or almost curable disease till we had four and now we're up to seven. Uh, so they haven't solved that problem yet and they've been doing this a lot longer than we have. But are we ready to follow any of the data that we've seen and actually how we treat people? Thank you. So now I can, uh, this is, I like that because now I can forward this to your fellow. Oh, no, you do your training. No, Eileen. I mean, the, the point is, uh, tenor, yeah, yeah, so faculty, sorry, sorry, Eileen. No, the, the point is so, um, you, you see the patient and you know that the reduction of pulmonary vascular system of at least 45% is uh, needed to reverse remodel, at least bring the right ventricle back into shape. And so you had to discuss it with this, the patient. And then with the evidence, which is not so strong because we never have done that study, what would you do? How would you approach this? Well, I'm also going to ask your neighbor yeah, after and then that. We'll ask Andy, OK. I'm also going to caution this by saying I, I, I was a radiation oncology resident uh, before I did pulmonary. So I, also, I understand the oncologic approach and the oncologic mindset of using chemotherapy very aggressively in patients. And so I mean, looking at the data, I think if you look at the data and you believe the data, and I think they're high quality studies that have been published. You know, the study out of France, I think, was, was a high quality high impact, very interesting study. I mean, I think, you know, in any patient, obviously, who's high risk, they should be on triple therapy. Um, in any patient who's intermediate risk, who would be, who has not improved to a low risk status early in follow-up, I would say they should be escalated to triple therapy is how I would approach that. Because we know now, too, there's ad advantages, you know, in those patients who reach a low risk status earlier in follow-up, survival tends to be better. So a low risk status in follow-up, just like an oncologic outcome, you have much better outcomes if you're aggressive early up front. So that's how I would approach it, if that answers, if that answers the question. I would say low threshold for triple therapy uh, in patients who are not improving adequately and quickly enough. Dr. Singh? I agree because we were trained by the same, same person. <laughs> oh, there is. <laughs> there is some dependency. <laughs> so if, the, if it is warranted clinically upfront, if patients you know, at high risk, then yes, upfront triple therapy is indicated. Yeah, otherwise, if patients are not improving on, on dual therapy, then escalation is indicated as well. So, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, Leopold. No, I was going to say, what do you think, Dr. Funknordergraf? I just would be interested in your thoughts. Yeah, I, was, I was very interested in Jane first, and then I will... <laughs> okay, sorry, Actually, I don't think you are interested, because I was going to say, no, my comment was going to be, but what about the data from RCTs, right? So you have RCT data that tells you that there really was not much of a difference. Yeah. So do yeah. we need to do another clinical trial? 
I mean, potentially, and I'll mention at this point, there is a clinical trial ongoing in of, uh, upfront, at least upfront prostacyclin therapy as a question of whether it's a disease-modifying agent in certain patients with PAH with, I believe, a real reveal risk score of nine or less, um, and that, that might be incorrect. But so I do think that additional high-quality trial would inform that decision, but at the same time, I think when you see it, it's it's probably not going to be the easiest trial to enroll for. I would think that would be a very heterogeneous population. You know, you're tracking patients ideally every couple of months when you start therapy, but maybe if, you know, you'd have to pick a good time limit in which you want to enroll. So I think it would be interesting to have high quality clinical trial data in that area, but having seen some of these, what I would consider like high quality retrospective studies, I wonder if we'd ever get there, especially, I think, with the advent of BMPR2 bonifying agents, I think might make it more difficult. Sorry, Dr. Singh, Dr. Washington. from the audience. Sure, we'll take our next question. Uh, great talks, uh, fantastic day. Uh, as stated earlier, I'm here to learn about RV. Um, so one of the questions I had before coming to this symposium is, I want to know in the expert's mind whether there is any value on a drug that is particularly for RV dysfunction. Um, I, I imagine if a drug does both nice things in the vasculature, lung, and heart, that would, that would be nice, but let's make it more controversial. Just, it does nothing to PVR, but only works on RV um, in the context of triple therapy and everything. Do you see value of that? Well, we, we essentially have that, you know, you can extrapolate data if you put in a right side of mechanical circular to support device with a fixed PVR, you know, how much, how much benefit would you get out of that, right, without addressing the afterload. So I think the disease inception needs to be addressed. So. Yeah, I mean, it's almost akin to a PA banding model, mm -hmm. um, what you see in, in either small animal models or... Um, uh, larger animal models, uh, we can definitely temporize, but at least in the case of PAH, it, it, it raises the question of you can get them a little bit better, but you're still going to be stuck with, uh, with a pretty significant problem. Right. I, I get that. I'm just saying that uh, that drug can be potentially used on top of standard of care, which reduce PVR and everything, right? Of course, I won't be offended if you say there is no value. I'm, I'm okay. I do think there is no drug. Sorry? There's, there, there is no drug which kills two mosquitoes with one beat. Uh, something like that. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure what the uh, what, what synonym is. I think it's too, too, too good to be sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I think you are waiting for Great. Thank you. I'm Ada Stefanesk. I'm a disclosure and adult congenital heart disease uh, specialist. And so I would love to foster more collaboration. I think the talks are fantastic, and I come from a world where we can fix pulmonary stenosis very quickly. We can fix the afterload on the RV and see how the RV changes over time. We have huge loads for um, pulmonary regurgitation that's chronic, and we can fix that in you know a snap of a finger or six hours in a cath lab. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so I would love to see how some of the wonderful work they're doing, how we could try that in congenital heart disease patients and see how the remodeling of the RV um, after pulmonary va valve replacement um, changes. And one question that we're obsessed with is RV dilation. So when the patients with congenital heart disease have chronic PR, we let them dilate their RVs until we came up with 160 for RV DV indexed based on some clinical data from 10 years ago that's really suboptimal. And now we're struggling to see if we should lower that number. What You've talked a lot about RV dimensions. What in the experience of a panel, like, do you have a number? Do you have a series of numbers? Do you have a range? Do you have a rate of expansion? How do you think about that? Well, the number is not there. Uh, the pulmonary stenosis is a really particular field, and that is because the right ventricle behaves differently, and that can be understood very well from the concept, so that the load is really in the, in the proximal part. Uh, so um, I do think the dimensions from the PH you can't extrapolate to the pulmonary valve stenosis or the, 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 so the proximal things, even not coming close to the bending, because it's different. So I don't know the numbers. I had a question for you, kind of. This, this is intriguing. We've, 
So we've recorded many of these, let's say, for with stenosis, a, a catheter-based implant of a valve. So there's the initial severe stenosis. You, you dilate that, you pop open the old annulus, you seat the new valve. So it's a fascinating thing because in the same patient you get, if you record, let's say, the right ventricular pressure, you get severe stenosis, you get wide open regurgitation when the annulus is popped, and then you get a new valve. And so in a 90 minute period of time, you get all of those conditions which we record, which is really fascinating. My question to you though, after you do, let's say, one of those procedures and you pull back your catheter, do you look at a pressure gradient between the RVOT and below? And do you commonly see that there's an intraventricular gradient that occurs? which to me is kind of fat. We've seen it many times. Is that something you see? That is, yeah. It depends on the initial anatomy of the patients. Many of the patients in charge of flow or the ones who had VSDs initially and um, that were repaired, they might have a muscle bundle in the RVOT. Yep. And so those are the ones that are more likely, especially those who came in also with some pulmonary regurgitation when the RV was dilated, the muscle bundles were kind of splayed apart. Yep. And then you fix the stenosis and uh, then the RV becomes hyperdynamic and then they, they develop a gradient. Um, so we, and then many of them, we put them on beta blockers and then a day or two or three, the RV relaxes yeah. a little bit and then we don't see that anymore. Yeah, cause that gets into the question then of the dimension. So if you've got regional differences in the contraction time, how do you accurately look at the dimension when maybe the, the outflow tract is not having the same contribution to the total volume? I don't know the answer to that, but I'm, yeah, it's fascinating. I, I, and especially now we're... The old paradigm was to do either surgical valves or um, short bioprosthetic valves, but now we're starting to implant to much bigger the self-expanding pulmonary valves that are this tall, and so then they affect the compliance of the whole PA and how that changes, and patients might have more distal disease, they may have older sense, and so on, and how that affects the, the change in the recovery of the red ventricle, I think, is really different. Thank you. Dr. Hooper. Hi. I wanted to come back to the discussion on, on triple therapy and triple combination therapy. And I'm not sure that I fully agree with what, what has been said. Um, it's, it's kind of in our field, sometimes we haven't done our homework. And the big, biggest gaps we have are on intravenous or parenteral prostacyclines. We only have the early data. And even that were not placebo-controlled trials. And still, everybody is saying these are the most efficacious treatments, which we certainly don't know, and I doubt that. And you said we have high-quality data, so it's difficult to perform um, prospective studies. It's not true. What we have is the study you mentioned from, from Paris. Um, the proportion of patients receiving upfront triple in that study was 4%, 4 0%. In computer, it's 1.2%. So and this, to me, this means that there, is, there are some factors why physicians believe that these patients should be treated with upfront triple in probably all over the world. And these are usually the young, classical, mostly female patients with all comorbidities. They tend to respond extremely well to whatever we do. They simply do have the best response. So looking at the survival curve, this is not just because of the treatment. It's also because of the patients. I'm very much convinced about that. And it becomes even worse when we look at addition of intravenous process cycle and treatment failures because then the improvement that we get is, is, is not substantial. And we have the, the most, still most expensive and most burdensome and most inconvenient and risky procedure here. And we, we shouldn't go out and, and recommend this based on the data. We, sh we should have done the studies. I agree. We won't do this, be doing the studies anymore because from next year on we will have other treatments that are probably much more efficacious than any prostacycline. And uh, therefore, we will focus on that. Still then, uh, Maris, um, and I do think it is an interesting topic, but I mean, and that is also a little bit alluding to what Aaron said, well, if you look to the previous historical survival curves, you had just a shift in time a bit, and but parallel, so it doesn't, so you might be a little bit nihilistic on the treatment effect. One way to explain this is still that if you give, let's say, prostacyclone alone, as in, in the past we did, you, uh, you lower systolic physical resistance, you improve cardiac output, the primary pressure remains the same, so your exercise capacity improved, nothing changed. And Tom's right, in particular, sorry, but we, we, RV work increases sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So, so the RV, the RV work even can increase. So that that is that's explaining probably the, the paradox improving and then having still very bad survival curves. However, also from the data from Olivier, he also published the, the long-term survival, and I agree very much on you. It is a very small proportion of those patients, the typical patients. 
those patients were over triple A treatment. And then you see something different because then the pulmonary arch pressure drops because the cardiac output is going to the max and then it drops. And that is something from the physiological point of view, helping the right ventricle. So I do think at the, at the oral treatment really adds to that, that phenomenon uh, uh, because uh, prostacycline at high dose alone doesn't achieve that. So um, I do think, uh, and that was by asking, uh, but what you do, uh, if this is a typical PAH patient, young, with this very smart, bad hemodynamics, you should at least, and that, that would be uh, and my advice, in the absence of data, go not only for improvement of exercise, but also for reduction of pulmonary artery pressure. And in that, in, in that interest, it is interesting to look to the sotatus data, but because then the pressure drops earlier, then stroke volumes goes up, which is for the right ventricle, paradise. So I'm not saying that, that but, but I do think it's good to, to think about in physiological terms. So if the cardiac index is very low and you are providing one drug, then the cardiac index will improve, but pressure will not improve. So that probably is real, the big argument to say, well, I needed everything possible to reduce pulmonary vascular resistance to the max so that I can reduce pulmonary arch pressure. Do you agree? Yeah, I don't disagree with anything you said. I'm, I'm just extremely careful in, in recommending this kind of treatment very broadly based on the data that we have because okay. I, I really believe that the data is not sufficient. I agree with you. I think, you know, mm. prostacyclins obviously really should come into play, like you're saying, in young patients who are high risk, who are intermediate high mm. risk at first follow-up. But I think really the hinging point comes when patients aren't improving on dual combination therapy. I think if you think you have a good candidate who can manage the burdensome effects of a prostacycline, because clearly it is very burdensome. You know, if it's subcutaneous, if it's pain, it's painful, if it's IV, it's clearly associated with a higher infection risk than somebody who doesn't have a, an indwelling central line. But I think you'd be hard pressed to not offer prostacycline therapy at that point. And I think at least in the States, when we look at what options we have, you know, we have inhaled oral IV, you know, you theoretically, and I think, you know, clinically, we see the quickest improvement coming with a parenteral prostacycline. I think when we look at the inhaled option, it's still four times a day. That is, and to me at least, that's still burdensome for a patient to have to bring a machine around to use it four times a day. And PO comes with a lot of side effects also. So, you know, I think if you have a patient and you're in that situation where the patient has not improved, it's important to discuss all the options with them. But if they think they can proceed with an IV prostacycline, if they're in an intermediate high-risk group, I think I think that you would be very hard pressed to not offer it. But I completely agree with all of your points. And I agree that our data is retrospective. And you know, I think the artisan studies like that will be very helpful in, in going forward. So yeah. I completely agree with you, Dr. You know, don't, don't get me wrong. Um, we have the largest process I can program in Germany. So we use it, yeah. uh, but. <laughs> so then you know, yeah. 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 Did you have another question? No. Oh, I'll try. <laughs> So, all right, so just changing the topic away from triple therapy for a second, I am a big fan of PV loops. And now, after hearing all of these different talks about with PV loops and how we should be measuring them, how should we be measuring them? What kind of variables should we be using? Off of the, well, first is how you're going to get a high quality, believable loop. Well, I mean, that's what I want to know. Well, how should I be doing this? Because. I've heard now three or four different ways to do this. Well, the, the, you know, the, the best continuous, easiest way to do it is with a conductance catheter. Of course, in the absence of a conductance catheter. So, and then there are the limitations and the problems and using it, you probably use it on the left. I mean, putting a conductance into the left side, is pretty easy and you get a long, elongated ellipse, you put it in the apex mm -hmm. and it works. The problem that we and other people have had, I know, and we've tried to do this over and over again, is you put it transvenous through the tricuspid valve into the apex. It's very position sensitive. It's respiratory sensitive. You probably are not getting the RVOT consistently. And if you move anything, all of a sudden the signal is out of phase. So I tend to think, and then the question is whether you want to do it with cable occlusion or some preload deviation, which adds a whole other level of complexity. Um, I think there is the possibility of doing pretty high quality 3D echo um, and using the 3D echo and your, uh, a pressure that's ideally done almost simultaneously over the same sequence of beats that you use to create the 3D echo. 
Um, now, you're not going to be able to do a cable occlusion on that, so you would have to apply some kind of single beat metric on top of that. Okay. And if we want to do single beat metrics, how should we do them? My inclination now is I don't use the Pmax model anymore. I use the Senzaki model. When I have a volume signal, I think it provides a higher fidelity signal. It also gives me the V0 value. It, so um, I tend to use that one now, both for the left and the right ventricle. How about? Yeah, I, I agree with many things Paul said, but um, uh, and one of the things is that conductance catheter is a problem in the RV because uh, we have that open tricuspid valve, so you never know what volume is measuring, especially, and I'm talking about severe pH, so it's different different in, in healthy persons because then it's perfect probably, but in severe pH, the tricuspid is more open than closed, and so uh, we, we never know what the borders are which we are measuring. In severe pH, I believe uh, the right ventricle is in a stationary state, so it, it has a, uh, uh, it, in, in a supine position, it's always the same frequency, so extrapolation can be done. So, uh, if, so you don't need it simultaneous measurement. In not severe pH, certainly you need. We have done uh, uh, simultaneous uh, invasive measurements in the MRI and compared it with the measurements and non simultaneously pH was not much of a difference. Actually, the most essential parts of the pressure volume loops are the anti-systolic as well as the anti-systolic volume as the stroke volume, and you don't need it for that at this point. PMX, I am annoyed like Paul, as I am a bit, bit annoyed with the assessment, because when it was done, it looked perfect. But if you look to the, especially the the um, uh, post, the, 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 the downslope of the curve, it doesn't, you can't fit a sinus through it. And I do think many people who have tried to do that have found this out. So. This downslope is different as the upslope, the ice volumetric contraction. And this probably, again, has to do with a similar thing, which is the leftward movement of the septum. So it's more uh, gradual, slowly doing so. I do think the PMAX is quite, uh, is, is a very nice concept, but uh, quite difficult to achieve. And you don't know the amount of points. So in my opinion, uh, and the volumes and the stroke volume and the pressures are the most important. And what's between, I don't care too much about that. <laughs> And getting indeed uh, the, 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 then from this point out, out the, um, the the V zero, I agree again. Uh, this this is a very interesting concept, the Sensaki concept to get it. Yeah, and the, 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 on that, I, ideally, I do think it's possible to generate the majority of the metrics that we get off of classic PV loops with cable occlusion to actually do it without creating the full loop. So with just your end systolic or end diastolic volume or maximum and minimum, and that becomes the assumption that they're the same. And I think you can actually generate quite closely um, the similar metrics without having to create a full loop. So when you're comparing like you're taking cath data and MR data that are not simultaneous, they're also, if you take those signals, they're not actually sampled at the same rate. You're assuming they're from R wave to R wave, and we did this in a pub paper we published a while ago, where we had MR data and cath data, and we looked at, there were patients who, at the time of their MR, their heart rate was 65. Well, they're not stressed. In the cath lab, getting needles stuck in their neck, their heart rate's 100. So if I'm gonna take the- Depends whether you use lidocaine or not. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's you need to use the lidocaine. But it just shows, that comparing those conditions over time, how do I, adequately synchronize those. Yeah. yeah. So that yeah, it right. becomes this technical limitation on that. How do you handle arrhythmias? Uh, <laughs> try to ignore them. An AF or something is a is a problem. And then the other thing, how do you handle respiratory variation? Yep. So we tend to take a signal average over three respiratory cycles, which I think Aaron had suggested to us before. And we do that during exercise, but I don't know if that's the best the best way to do that. I don't know how you guys handle respiratory variability, either with exercise or just during a supine cath? Well, we, we, don't, we aren't doing conductance yet, um, if that's what you mean. Uh, well, even, even that or just a standard, standard oh. generating your, your pressures over a period of time, what you're going to take for using your reference for your defining your, your pressures, taking respiratory vary, or do you try to just do it at end exhalation? But during exercise, you've got forced inhalation, forced exhalation, and you don't really have a, an end exhalation interval. I don't, if you can tell me. How yeah, now we're getting into another debate, right? Yeah. Uh, particularly with wedge pressure, right? Because, um, yeah. I mean, 
I, not to say, change the subject completely, but I, I would be an advocate for really nailing down the terminology behind uh, RVPA coupling. And uh, I, I've noticed, for example, as you have alluded to, um, the, the stroke volume, the, the ratio of volumes has been termed RVPA coupling, which it's, it's not actually RVPA coupling. There's a huge assumption in there in, in terms of the, the V naught, right? Yep. And, and we all know that the V naught, we don't know exactly what it is, but we do know it's big in a big right ventricle. So that's an assumption we can't make. And especially in those patients, it's probably applied to where the ventricle's big. So I would be an advocate for really nailing down the terminology. The other thing I see mistaken all the time, oftentimes in the literature, is saying that they've can, someone who's done single beat is doing PV loops, which is not. That's an, that's not a PV loop. There's no loop involved. It's it's two points. It's two data data points. So I would I would be an advocate for that. <laughs> Yeah, it is important, Frans, and also because uh, Nick mentioned uh, indeed the SANS method, which uh, uh, um, uh, assumed that V0 is zero, zero, which is not the case, and especially if you're more dilated right ventricles, V0 is not at all zero at all. It's, uh, it's huge, huge. And term, getting the terminology right in the coupling terms is difficult, so probably we had to, 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 to get different coupling terms or something like that because it is confusing sometimes. And I do think we all agree on that. Uh, and that doesn't mean that, uh, I, I mean, if you take it to true V0, it's actually one divided by right ventricular ejection fraction. So it is the similar information as right ventricular ejection fraction. You can calculate it very easily that this is the case. So, of course, it's clinical relevant. That does, so not being coupling doesn't say it is not clinical relevant. So the observation that the RV starts to improve when the PVR is reduced by 45%, should we be cathing patients at a certain time after starting therapy to gauge the PVR and determine and confirm that we've reduced the PVR by 45% and keep on adding medications until we do? Is that, would that be part of a clinical... Uh, I, I, I would say probably... The best way, of course, is to assess the imaging and then to confirm whether the right ventricle improved because also some patients, the right ventricle improved a lot by 30%. But there are different people with different have access to imaging or whatsoever. And if you have only a good right heart cat lab and your echo uh, group is not much interested in the right ventricle and your MRI is only mean, made for brain uh, assessments, then I definitely would go for the PVR. <laughs> But but improvement. But if you see improvement on your imaging, then it's fine, irrespective of the PVR. At least the reduction below 45% predicts that your right ventricle will follow. That's at least what you know. It's not a plea for a very invasive approach. Although I, in my lab, we, uh, we uh, repeat easily uh, right heart cat. I guess Joanne. No, and I mean, and they're very easy to repeat now that you can just do it through a brachial vein. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I was, you know, as part of the guidelines that come out, would that be a consideration to add, yeah. you know, because right now mo many, most doctors don't routinely perform follow-up cardiac casts, um, you know, unless there's an actual need, but perhaps this could be a way of, of um, establishing that. So. One of the questions I have for the group is um, when you're – when you're doing these in the context of research studies, are you using standard clinical swans? Are you using a standard cath lab pressure transduction setting? Or is there anything that you're doing that you found to be necessary to improve the high fidelity, high quality uh, pressure signals? You, you, you can start. Uh, typically, we use the classic fluid fill swan setup. Um, we've um, done many trials of using the um, uh, FFR wires because mm -hmm. the RV part is pretty large and it can feed the FFR wire and we get actually quite significant improvement in the fidelity of the RV tracing because mm -hmm. you, can, you can get simultaneous. If you pull back the fluid fill into the RV cavity and you have the FFR wire in the RV cavity, you get simultaneous transduction. Mm -hmm. But it's so cumbersome. 
right? Mm. So, so the idea, the ideal scenario is that if you have a small enough pressure wire that can feed into both the uh, PA and the RV, which we actually have tried in our animal model, and it gives us a wedge tracing that we've never seen before. And so that'll be the ideal setting, especially in exercise. Where do you normalize your pressure wire? Yeah, so I know certain groups balance it from the sheet for the RA, but we, we had suggested if you advance a swan to the PA and you feed the pressure wire through the RV, and then you'd retract the tip of the distal PA into the RV while simultaneously advancing the pressure wire, through the RV port, you can, you can then balance the two of them simultaneously. That's what we did. Interesting. So, too many hours in the cat lab, man. <laughs> Are you doing any um, curve smoothing filters, anything like that, or is it the, the, the raw signal? <laughs> we, yeah, most of the stuff we use for analysis um, generally has a 10 hertz filter. It's sampled at 1,000 hertz, so it's fast, but it's got a 10 hertz filter on it, which, which is necessary for the fluid filled. In our experimental or translational work, we use only micromanometers. Yeah. And so a lot of the things that we've published, some of the things we've published using pressure waveforms uh, work very well with micromanometers, and it's kind of a crapshoot with some of the fluid-filled systems just because of the quality of the signal. So, I mean, like calculating your Pmax off that, you can, we've done fluid-filled and micromanometry simultaneously, and sometimes they are perfectly the same, and other times they're just, they're just not. So, uh, optimally, I think the direction to go is with, with some sort of high-fidelity micromanometry. I kind of have a completely different question, but I am fully supportive of improving RV size and function, and it definitely makes me feel better when the RV size and function is improved on follow-up, but is there any evidence that it actually is correlated with improvements in patient-reported outcomes? Just curious. I'm, I'm not aware of any, but... Um, I don't think so. Um, and that is... And that is, that is because, uh, uh, well, well, at least uh, their survival is okay, and that's what we know. But I do think the patient will only face cardiac index or cardiac output. So I do think, but I don't have the data, that, um, that, 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 that you can't make a distinction in patient-reported outcomes between uh, a reverse remodeling, well, I call it reverse remodeling of the right ventricle, or get it back into shape, First, the patient who is not getting reverse remodeling of the right ventricle, but has a normalized cardiac output. I don't think there will be much of a difference, but I have not. So I do think the patient's reported outcome will not be making a differentiation between those groups, I guess. No. So, Hillary, great question. I would actually pose that with LPVDomics, where we have... It, right, so, and Evelyn also meant to tell you this too, we have imaging from baseline and then follow-up, and we also have um, three quality of life questionnaires from baseline and follow-up, so you can look to see who improved and who didn't. <laughs> Talk to Bob. <laughs> I think it's an interesting question. You'd think that they would improve, certainly, and feel Right, but you may not know the side effects from the medications that got them to RV improvement may be enough to change the quality of life in the other direction. We're also um, encouraging involvement from outside investigators. We have an RFA process also, so. Yep. Sure. So I would like to thank all of our speakers today, our panelists, 